Growing with fishes. Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast, episode 245. It's kind of hard to believe that we're that we're almost at 250 already. I feel like we just did the 200th episode and the 10,000th subscriber episode, so it's uh it's pretty cool to to have this many. So um. Uh, today dude, we're back. It, dude, it, and I'm just gonna cut you off right there. This is the first time I've been on the show that you didn't fuck up the intro. So <laughs> <laughs> you got a fancy video and stuff. Like this is pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> actually uh, shout out to Dirtman and Dan of the Embracing Organics podcast. I went when I was over with him. Uh, I stopped in to see him when I went to uh, when my mother passed back in December of 2019 and he had his whole slick thing with the intro and all that and i was like man i gotta make one of those so i had a a friend of mine make me up one later on and then finally got the hang of getting it all to work sometimes we still fuck it up but uh we're getting better at it (laughs) i'm just he's just teasing man Uh, i thought i think it's pretty cool though the video so good work yeah i think we're gonna make an outro too that kind of has like me and marty's uh links and all that and stuff like that because i i think that's kind of neat too so we're working on adding some new stuff but uh thanks everybody for watching um we're back again with josh from dutch blooms he also is the organizer of the science of regenerative organic cannabis cultivation conference uh, i think i'm probably the only person that could recite that from memory without fucking it up aside from josh <laughs> um, but uh uh thanks for joining us josh yeah dude um it's a it's a wild night on uh, YouTube tonight. Thanks for having me. There's a bunch of people doing shows tonight. We also <laughs> got uh, the great Clackamas Coot. Howdy. Uh, my camera's me- messed up on my new computer, so I guess I'll be uh, doing uh, Black Magic. How's that? <laughs> we'll call it. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, we also have uh, Fumador. Our fumador. Hello, <laughs> everybody. Cheers. And uh, Marty from AP Meds. Hey, what's going on? Man? For those of you guys that don't know, uh, Marty and I have an extensive online aquaponic cannabis class. If you guys want to check that out, uh, Marty, do you want to tell everybody? Uh, actually, you can, you can check that out over at apmjclass.com. Um, Marty, do you want to tell everybody uh, you've been working on some super fucking awesome content for the class? Um, why don't you give everybody a quick preview of that before we get started? <laughs> yeah, so the two that I've been working on, uh, well, I guess there's three main ones that I'm working on, which is the uh, Greenhouse Bill Project, where we're putting together a you know, fairly small, light depth greenhouse, uh, just my own setup, and then an aquaponic system inside of that. Um, we're also starting kind of a more like homesteading track, I guess. Uh, so I've been uh, ordered and put together a portable sawmill. Uh, so we're going to saw up some of our own logs and build an aquaponic system out of it. Uh, so that's going to be uh, pretty exciting. And then the other one that I've been working on for a little while now is um, some scouting videos for IPM. So just the process of going through and scouting um, for uh, pests. Um, counting beneficials versus uh, pests and when to release and you know, various uh, IPM related uh, concerns, but sort of real time in a grow. So um, those are the kind of the three main ones that I'm working on right now. In addition to the um, next section of nutrient videos is up next. We just did the k and videos for the last ones that I posted. And then we'll start going through each of the nutrient slides uh, one by one um, and uploading those. So those are encoding right now and they'll get uploaded in the next day or so. So those are kind of the stuff that's going on in the class. So it's a, the portable sawmill is super cool. I, I was missing a couple of parts. They're sending those to me. They should get here tomorrow. And I'll be able to uh, finish that up and we can start um, milling out some pretty cool lumber. I have some trees here that already fell and a couple of snags that um, have been standing dead for a little while and dried out. So 
we have some some logs that are ready to mill up and be able to start um, building out the greenhouse aquaponic system with that. So that's gonna be fun. If you've seen the lumber prices lately, <laughs> you would probably know what's driving uh, that decision. It didn't take long to uh, do some math on <laughs> all the different projects I want to do. That the cost, if you're doing any sort of aquaponic system with lumber and you haven't priced it out in a while, you might want to <laughs> revisit some of those costs because uh, even just like the beds that you see, you know, Steve just scroll past there. Um, you know, lumber for that stuff, if you haven't priced it out in like a year, uh, you know, it's easily triple the price uh, that it was before. So just based on the projects I have here around the homestead um, and the lumber, the cost of the lumber that we'd have to put into that was uh, more than justified a sawmill. And who doesn't want a portable sawmill? So that's what I've been working on. Yeah, and we, we're constantly adding new content to that every month and, uh, and also have two live sessions. The next live session will be June 30th uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific, and, and that allows students to have kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with the teachers as well or show off their grow and ask questions and things like that. If you're kind of growing as you learn, uh, it kind of gives you a chance to ask questions uh, as if we came to visit your grow. So it kind of gives people a, a different kind of experience to learn. Um, we also have one other quick uh, housekeeping thing before we get started, as soon as I find it here in my stuff to share the screen, right? Here it is. Um, I will be doing a talk uh, with the Aquaponics Association here on um, June 29th, uh, which is my sister's birthday, uh, at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. EST. Uh, uh, we're going to run over an hour um, because we got to go over nutrients vegetables and all that stuff for aquaponics but we're going to cover kind of um, do's and don'ts pitfalls uh, nutrient misnomers and kind of help fix a, a lot of people's problems that they're having with aquaponics in general uh, by giving them some some good data based on you know hundreds of different farms uh, that i've worked with over the years you know and the water testing from those farms so uh, we're going to talk about that and uh, try to help uh, help steer aquaponics in the right direction because it really is an area that has some of the weakest education out there um, as far as helping people get started and uh, we're going to help fix that problem. Um, we also have are, are going to talk about good clean inputs to make sure people aren't dosing things that are going to end up uh, causing them issues later on. So. Uh, definitely check that out. And that's part of the Aquaponics Association. Uh, we'll be doing a webinar series as well on um, a home grow aquaponic cannabis with them uh, coming up, uh, small system builds, uh, how to run the system, and then a little bit about cannabis and cannabis business uh, as part of a, a multi-part series that we'll be doing after this. So uh, definitely look forward to that if you're looking for more free education on aquaponics. Alrighty, um, Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and what you've been up to. I know you got uh, all kinds of stuff you've been scheming. Yeah, man. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure where to start. I got lots of stuff going on. I'm, I'm actually simo IG and I'm going to hang that up because I was trying to get some folks to pop on over. Um, yeah, I've been building my farm out, you know, ever since COVID happened, um, weed crisis flipped around, you know, and um, so I've just really been focusing on, you know, we call it 502, which is the law that was passed here in Washington, but my recreational farm, um, I built out a second hoop house or greenhouse, um, depending on how you look at it, which, which is a, a topic I'd like to just start with right there. Everyone uses, puts plastic over a structure and calls it a greenhouse. This is not true. There is actually a definition of what a greenhouse is and a definition of what a hoop house is, and a definition of what a high tunnel is. These are three separate things. And, and I, I just, um, I have a greenhouse and, and that's the one you guys have seen that has lights and heating and climate control. And that, that's pretty much the definer in a greenhouse is that you have climate control in there. You don't necessarily need to have lights in there, um, but, but climate control, meaning you heating and cooling, um, bare minimum, and, and that makes it a greenhouse. Um, hoop house <clears throat> doesn't have that. You know, it has just plastic walls and then a high tunnel has, you know, no ends and usually has a, a raised up uh, bottom end. <clears throat> um, I don't know, that's just kind of like a little, I, I, I learned a lot of things in the vegetable, from the vegetable world 
And um, I think that that is uh, a good world to dip your head into if you're serious about uh, gardening tech. Um, I think, you know, I, I definitely uh, do believe that cannabis farmers are really on the cutting edge of, you know, nu nutrients and pushing plants. But um, in terms of practice, um, in terms of, uh, I don't know, just, just getting things done at scale and efficiencies, um, vegetable gardeners, market vegetable gardeners have a ton of cool tech out there, uh, especially in the last handful of years. It's really cool. You can check out um, all these farmers, Gene, uh, I can't, I'll mess up their names, Gene, uh, what is it? How do you say it, Steve? Jean Monte Funtier is like a French dude up in up in uh, Ontario, I think. Um, and then the what's uh, Sink Sink something Farms? Uh, I'm gonna mess up all these names. I'm the worst at remembering names. Um, but uh, anyways, I'm I'm just kind of going off on that. But yeah, I, I've been I so I so I built I have this greenhouse and then I built out this new. It's kind of a hoop house now, but it, it's on its way to being a greenhouse. So it's it's got open walls right now. We're, we got a fan in it, but no, nothing's really controlled. Um, by the time I get to fall, it's going to be a library. Long story short, I built a library to stack my genetics um, and stack other people's genetics that, that maybe need a, need a house. Um, it's something that I didn't realize that I desperately needed. And I built it to kind of just have as part of my system. And, and then I just kind of looked up one day and realized this is, this is what I've always needed, a full-time library that I can just stick plants um, directly in the soil. You know, they're not pots. You know, that's, that's a big deal for me. You know, I don't fuck around with too many pots. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of headache um, compared to growing in, in living soil beds or in an aquaponic systems where you can just put a plant in and all the nutrients are there. And, the, you know, that everything's chill. You know, I dare say aquaponics is a little bit simpler in, in that, you know, you don't even have to water or think about that aspect. That's my favorite Jean Martin Fort Fortier. Thank you. What were you going to say? Well, I said not watering is my favorite part. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Um, I mean, like, probably, yeah, it's probably one of the most beneficial, I think, like, even in terms of, like, I just went out of town for, like, four days. <clears throat> and obviously when I got back and it's been like, you know, 95 degrees here, and I don't have like super climate control environment. Like the shop gets pretty warm. So the plants that I have that are just sitting in pots, we're not super happy after four days of hot weather and no water, but the aquaponic systems are just like, they, they love no it. Problem. Like I, I have to get in there and train immediately because otherwise uh, you know, it's going to be difficult to maintain a, a quality scrub without, um, you know, on the indoor, I'm trying to stretch that 12 plant count out as much as I can. So I want to, you know, keep a tight net. And so they grow so fast that in that four days, if I, uh, you know, if I haven't um, been here to be training them, you know, there's, there's some good tops already forming. And so it's just so much easier. Most, most of my plants now, I only, Ideally, I only hand water them um, or top water them uh, twice in their entire life. So they come out of an aquaponic system in the cloner, go into a dual root zone pot, and then put into another aquaponic system. And then they're just top watered a couple of times uh, until their roots end up hitting the water. So ideally, you know, in their entire plant cycle from clone to harvest, they're only watered twice. That's the that's the ideal flow that I have right now. Have you ever, um, either of you, Steve or Marty, messed with uh, like almost going sips on your on your um, sub irrigate or your your dual root zones, like putting a plastic thing to actually kind of really seal in that wicking? So you I, know what I'm saying. We, so we had. I tried. There was a an aquaponics farm that does large scale tomato production in Florida. And we were trying to perfect peppers and tomatoes with the idea of being of switching over to cannabis, uh, you know, as fast as we could after that. And we tried 18 different soil mixes and a whole bunch of different pot styles and all kinds of stuff. And then we tried it with cannabis in, in Colorado. And we had a lot of issues with the sips. Um, uh, I think now that I have a better understanding of microbes and if I was dosing with like 
good la uh, IMO and labs and how to really and how to now that I have a better understanding of the soil stuff, uh, I think I could pull it off. But back then I didn't have that higher level of understanding. Um, but uh, I like having the two separate zones of control. Um, I, I do things slightly different than Marty. So I'll have a separate top watering system. So we'll have, um, in fact, I could show a diagram. Let me, uh, I want to hear that, but let me, let me rephrase my question because I, you answered a different question, but um, I want to hear about the two different ways that you do it, top watering versus only watering once. Um, but my question was about in, in doing a dual root zone, aquaponics dual root zone, have you ever tried to put plastic around the top of the pot similar to um, the sub irrigated planters where the, it just kind of really holds that moisture in for wicking better than uh, maybe a mulch would? Yeah, I did that. Um, so the last run I did at my indoor before I moved here, um, I, I only had like maybe six plants mm. or something like that. Um, I covered the top of the dual root zone with plastic for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it really helped fight uh, thrips um, by having a physical cover over the top of the only soil around for them to reproduce in. Um, and then I could really treat the, um, you know, that plastic pretty heavily with whatever I wanted to and not you know, worry about it getting soaked up into the root zone. So it really helped uh, treat thrips for one thing, but also because uh, Chris Trump had recently been on the podcast and was talking about encouraging fungal growths throughout flower. So the idea being that by top dressing with Bokashi brand and covering the top uh, throughout the flower phase, it would encourage more fungal growth by, um, you know, just it being darker on top of the soil and staying more moist. Um, I haven't done that yet in this new system, mostly just because I've that was on done. Mm. Go ahead. Mm. Go ahead, Coot. I no, I apologize. I thought the microphone was off. I I apologize. Oh, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. Excuse me. No, that's fine. So I had, I had really good luck with it. It really helped uh, with IPM. It, I really, it did get a nice mat, you know, like you see in, uh, you know, developed really quickly. So do you typically uh, do any mulch in your um, dual root zone pots? No. Living? No. <laughs> I don't. I don't typically. I have been, I mean, I guess I have in a, in a way because a lot of times when I top dress from my worm bin, I get a lot of just like natural uh, sprouts that come in and I chop those and drop them on top, but nothing like purposeful, like, you know, clover or anything that, you know, that you see with the more natural, you know, chop. Did you uh, do, try, do try something one day from just to like entertain me? And like, just, just find I live for your entertainment, Josh. What can I do? <laughs> just grab like a pile of, of wood chips and just like fill one yeah. of your pots, like, like a good, like six inches, you know, or four inches, mm -hmm. a good heavy ass amount over the top. So it's, it's just brimmed and then go, f follow your same tech where you, like you said, water it once or twice, you know, um, I, I just would be curious about how with that versus the plastic and which is, is, uh, that would, you know, Sure. Because that when I when I when I build my living soil beds and I harsh on people big time about this shit ain't going to work unless you have mulch, period. Like you are going to fight uphill all day long unless you have mulch. And and uh, I see people all day long in, in these commercial facilities without mulch. And, it, and well, it's just the, like the sawdust from the portable sawmill is going to give me access to, a, you know, a, a very clean known yep. source of, of wood sawdust that uh, I'm going to work with one of my friends who, you know, what, I forget what the term is for somebody who, you know, grows mushrooms or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, they're super into mushrooms and stuff. Fuck it here. There you go. I love it. We'll keep it. <laughs> um, and so we'll basically be using the sawdust from that to create um, you know, inoculated bags of sawdust uh, to grow mushroom style compost or different types of mushrooms in. So we definitely want to, uh, you know, expand on that in the future. So I'll definitely have access to that, but I have some wood chips, you know, that I can, or even just some, uh, you know, I, I have a ton of leaf litter around out here that I can throw in there also. 
Yeah, that would be it, it, yeah, I, 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 some I, dead wood. I'm sure. Yeah, 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 dead wood bark. Um, it's got to be. It, it can't be like a fresh wood chip, right? Um, because that that will dry obviously dry, dry take your nutrients Unless away. Unless you but, inoculate it with something. Yeah, right? inoculate it or or just like you like a something that go on your woods to do one pot. It wouldn't. It's not going to take that much material. Go just like right. find some debris. You got you know oh, the right yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean yeah. we have like almost eleven acres, so we have yeah. You know, plenty of, and it's mostly just oak forest so there there's plenty of dead wood around and that's that's part of the reason that you know we want to be able to kind of complete some of those ancillary cycles too of you know we really need to uh you know obviously forest fires are a very real thing in the area last year you know we had towns very you know very close to us basically burned to the ground we've already had a couple of fires this year and it's super early for that it's really dry not a lot of water so you know, we have some forest cleanup on the property that has to get done and, you know, being able to utilize that as much as possible, um, on, you know, all the way from start to finish from lumber to sawdust, um, is kind of something we want to get into. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm looking into getting a mill too. Um, you know, um, same thing, wood prices. And I, I have, I have 10 acres and five of it is in wood. And, sure. and there's a lot of doubt. Like I, I had to clear an acre of wood. So I have piles of lots of good wood. And I, I literally just lack the experience and have some guys that are helping me. They're like, dude, we should just mill this and start cranking it and, you know, sort it out. And now you got the tractor. I have a, a claw on my tractor so I can go pick this up and move yep. it around. And yeah. um, so it's, it's a, uh, and it's a, uh, it's, it's, you know, just a, something along the process that I've always wanted to get into. I, you know, my real goal is just to, to do everything, you know, just to be hundred percent sustainable and self-sufficient and, and, and have fun building shit and learning shit all along, all along the way, you know? So we were yeah. um, part of what I was trying to, trying to do was I have, so I, one weak point in my farm is, is the drying curing s- setup. And I originally went with the shipping container idea and you guys have seen that. And I, I, I put up poly board, you know, and, and that wasn't going to be the, just a straight shipping container. Obviously, wasn't going to be fine. Uh, I first put up uh, fiberglass. Bat, yeah, I framed them and then put fi- fiberglass batted insulation. They sweated, molded, had to rip that out, Dumbo. And then I thought, OK, I'll put in poly board. So that pink two inch thick, really nice right. stuff. I put that in. Same thing. Uh, it worked better. Um, but it would still sweat through the cracks um, in different times, you know. So then I added spray foam, and I have, you know, I have I have a ventilation, um, and a couple of them I have overpowered um, AC, one overpowered AC, you know, in one of them, and um, it's just been a, this hugest struggle um, to to dry weed properly in there, and it's taken me a long time to understand that because I I moved from indoor cultivation to pretty much outdoor i just recently got my life depth this spring so for the last three four years i've been one at one one a year drying weed in this thing so it's you know what i mean it's three runs to figure you know figure what's going on i honestly kind of feel stupid but um so i i, I was trying to come up with a different approach and i thought i'm thinking about all these ideas and, and money is the biggest inhibitor you know like the, the right thing to do would just be a bit build a big badass building you know without built proper and um but but money's the deal and so i thought about maybe putting my shipping containers in line and and putting a space between them you know like kind of two lines and and then building a room between them and that's where we started entertaining the idea of of uh um, getting the mill and and doing all that and we went into a bunch of design concept stuff and and end of the day i just kind of pulled the plug and I, I got on a website, and found that I could get some mini splits, uh, some some really, you know, 9K mini splits and, and put those in there. And I was like, I'm just going to do that and throw a shade cloth over the top of the thing and call it a fucking day. And that'll that'll give me a ton of control. You know, those mini splits are only 9K, but they'll actually do a lot. They're insulated. And if I get the, the insulation over the shipping containers. I'm going to be in a pretty good shape. You know, it doesn't usually get too hot here. We're in the heat, heat pandemic or heat epidemic that a lot of people are, are seeing, but our high is 94, you know, and people are freaking the fuck out, but still that's like, you know, to put things in perspective, you know, it, um, so anyways, along, along the process, I, I start, I, you know, this is coming down. I just ordered these, uh, 
mini splits. They're here. I'm going to put them in this next week. And I, I started, you know, I'm four weeks away from my harvest. So I'm, it's, you know, shit's cl- time. The time is counting down. I look up what it's going to cost me for a shade cloth. They're like 1500 bucks. I'm like, God damn it. I don't got 1500 bucks right now. Like, it's like that, <laughs> you know? And so I'm like, kind of like humming and hawing, like, all right, well, maybe I'll find a way to make some money here. And then, yeah. And I'm just like thinking on it and, and uh, then I real then I had the the idea of uh, my buddy asked me he's like have you ever done living roof living soil roof on top of there, and I was like well yeah I kind of went down that road and and fucked it up, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I did a couple designs on this one shipping container so I, you know just like a knucklehead I put 12, 12 by twelve inches uh, two by twelves up around this whole thing and thought I'll make one big flood and drain table, you know like hell yeah, and. Uh, threw a bunch of liner in there and a bunch of gravel up there and and the the, the thing went boy you yeah. know on inside and so i shovel it off cleaned it up called my buddy who's a welder and told him things like oh yeah you knucklehead they're super strong you just gotta reinforce the middles so he came out and he welded and put in a bunch of bars and then we put the whole thing back together and it still was buckling you know it just wasn't done right and um, I need a thicker steel to reinforce the thing type thing. And so I just kind of like tuck my tail defeated at that point. This was a number of years ago. And then, uh, so anyways, I'm, I'm telling this long story to say the other day, I'm drinking beer with my buddy. We're just kind of like doing that on it. And I was like, oh shit, uh, I could do uh, the channels, the um, um, NFT channels right on top of this thing like that like and then grow some plants let the plant canopy be the shade you know like in the nft channels wouldn't be so heavy and the or like like the uh the um like a media bed would be. yeah yeah like a media bed would sorry he, he tripped me out looking at that um but yeah so that's the so then and then i thought, started thinking about the sides and it's like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna grow something up the sides and like what can i grow in four weeks hops so I got all these rhizomes in, in today and I'm basically going to line the, the, the edges of my shipping container with, uh, you know, troughs that I'll line with, with EDM and fill with gravel and, and flood it with aquaponic water. Just, you know, run it through there and, and grow hops directly in it straight up the sidewalls. And then I'm going to cover the tops of my shipping containers in two inch poly board and, and make NFT, um, you know, channels or, or, uh, you know, gutter channels, gutter connect, you know, for, for, for lack of uh, the term, the proper term channels just to run across the top and plant a bunch of mustard and shit that's going to pop up and grow really, really quick and create a canopy. And um, I don't know that the, I, long story short, but I think, think it's a pretty cool idea. I'm excited um, for a, a fun little aquaponics project like that. Very cool. Yeah, you're showing sure. video here, Steve. Of, of Go back there, Steve, for a sec, if you can. Do you want to show us around your farm now? Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll yeah, go back to that right there with it, with it, with the I'm water. Because so, for those of you that don't know, Josh is like a very unique and super cool uh, design to his farm with the water table being what it is at his property. He really can kind of do this cool hybrid living soil aquaponic system across the whole property. It's it's very unique and really cool, uh, especially if you haven't seen it before. Well, so I'll sh- let's talk through. Uh... Maybe if you can forward to the part where I'm looking looking up the water stream and you can see the water, it'll make a little more sense. So there's, I'll, I'll walk you guys through what's going on now. There's no water in it because we're working on it. Um, but essentially, that, what you're looking at there is is going to be um, a radial flow filter. It'll be the top of you know the top of this section, the, the highest point, and then you can see the water travels down through this. Um, it's blurry, you know, obviously it's fast forwarding. This is perfect, Steve, through this, this canal, if you will. And you see these two hoops and there's the water. You can kind of see it. Um, it flows through this canal. Then there's another little settling pond, um, on the back end of that. And then it goes into a big pond down below it on the other side of that fence that you're looking at. And so, um, yeah, this is kind of like another settling pond right here. Like I was saying, there's a pond on the back end of the wall. 
And so the, the, on the pond that's on the back end of the wall, that's where the, the mass water storage is. And, you know, that's where all the nutrients are going to settle from uh, fish and everything that we'll have in the system. We'll have some geese, a, a handful of geese, very few geese in the back just to kind of be um, security. And um, anyway, so the water gets pumped up this channel, you know, via a pipe under under it and then it hits into that that little pond up there that i told you guys will be is about to become the radio flow filter so i'll be cleaning that up putting a liner in it and then plumbing it so that i have a drain on the bottom and i can suck the poop out of it you know and then it'll come down this channel and uh I, we're building you know we're halfway through building basically a, a day we have a dam and uh two dams and uh, one, the final thing is kind of a chamber. So it'll be like a cement chamber that the water flows through. And previous to that, it's a, it's a dam that will create a, um, a flood and drain situation, just like in a hydroponic or aquaponics bed, flood and drain, ebb and flow bed, where the water will come out of the radial flow, overflow into the stream, clean water without any sediment or solids in it. And then it'll, it'll rise and flood in this channel um, you know, pretty slowly and we'll have some plants growing in it, you know, for sure, probably some big, big plants and do some big 20 gallon, you know, dual root zone things and fuck around and have some fun. And then, and then at the finished thing will go into this uh, concrete chamber that will kind of have a wood top that we'll, we'll put on it. And then the water will continue on out of there into the stream that you were just looking at. And the, so inside that cement chamber, here, I'll walk back and we can look at it. You guys don't even know how chill I am right now. I'm, I'm sitting here with my feet in a kiddie pool. <clears throat> and that, that water that's in the, in the cement chamber, um, I'll suck up into, flip it around. I'll suck up into um, a big 1500 gallon reservoir that I have that then will feed my entire property right now i am utilizing that gap that reservoir to feed my cannabis farm back in here but i'll eventually just put it right into um to, to our main line that goes into our house and everything and so um i also am building starting the summer a series of of ponds because our property you know if you can imagine it goes up that way uphill for five acres. So I'm gonna build a series of ponds that'll come down. And uh, as I as we lose water out of our main pond back here, I can open up a dam in one of those or run a pipe and a hose and, and siphon it and fill this thing up and have plenty of water. So here you can see everything's weed whacked and cleared out. I'm about to get down in here and liner this. I'll put a drain at the bottom with a pipe that comes up here that I can suck the poop out with a pump and then it'll flow down here into our dam and it'll have <coughs> excuse me flood and drain on this side we got to clean this all out and put a liner in it and then this will be our our clean clean water in here that we can pump up into this thing and then from here it goes on into here and out to the whole system so it's kind of it's kind of cool i think um I, i'm sure i'm going to run into some issues along the way sorry about that josh i muted you by accident i was trying to mute the uh uh other person that just joined those tech. so go, go ahead josh sorry about that yeah no that's all, all i was really saying is um um that's kind of it i'm sure i'm going to run into some issues as uh along the way you know um i don't have any fucking idea how i'm going to get that much calcium in the system or or iron you know um but it's it's not really set up to be a full nutrient load, you know, cause it's going into soil. So in the soil systems should have enough of that. And I could supplement that in easily enough. Um, the, the, the big, big point and big driver for me is clean, fresh water for my, my family, because, um, 
it's on as far as I am concerned with the, the, the water war. Um, the water war is fucking about to happen big time and people have already paid and bought in and they just haven't started to charge us. They haven't started to put the pressure on, um, but they are. And in the next couple of years, we're going to, it's going to be very clear. I think with, with, you know, it's, it's already starting now. We're having really record breaking heat this early. Um, so that's where, that's my motivation is to have my own water source. I drilled a well and it was bunk. It uh, flowed low and it had a bunch of toxins in it. It was going to cost me like another 20, 30 grand to filter it. And I was like, this is fucked. We get lots of rainfall here. We're always going to get lots of rainfall here. I just need to capture it and harness it. And so this is the beginning of my journey in that. Um, I think there's there's a lot more that I, I need to learn too, still honestly, in, in, in getting the water down into the earth. You know, this is my way to capture it so I can use it in the summer and put down but um i think just building the water table too is gonna be beneficial I, i'm not gonna have a lot of liners in the system <clears throat> we have a lot of clay so you know the water is going to be seeping down unless i be, build these series of ponds yeah i think you're right though i mean the, and on two things first of all rainfall capture is like critical and like on the top of my to-do list you know like i need to you know better capture way more rainwater than i do and then uh secondly the water wars are already starting here in southern oregon um we had recently we had a actually i think it's still going on um where counties are restricting um water delivery so water companies can't deliver to recreational cannabis grows um from public water sources and there there's like all of these like uh you know people that are on one on one side of regulation they are required to have water delivered if they don't have very specific water rights to be able to grow cannabis with and are now also not able to get water delivered because of the separate set of regulations so it's uh it's already started in terms of you know, the water wars, we had a chlorine shortage for it on the public water um, here. So they did like a, a voluntary uh, thing, but they stopped um, all water deliveries for um, what they called non-essential agriculture. So basically cannabis, like there's really nothing else on the list, you motherfuckers, you know right. what I mean? Like, that's it, you know, <laughs> like you could grow soybeans for government subsidy and that's still considered necessary, but you can't grow, can't you can't get water delivered for cannabis. Can we, so, can we can we talk about the almond trees? Because those almond trees, like one almond tree, uses six to eight hundred cannabis plants worth of water. And the it's per you, gross, you can cycle. talk about it all you want, but you could probably still get water delivered. That's that's the reality of it right now. Is if you had an orchard full of almond trees, they will bring you all the water that you wanted to. Um, they should grow almond trees where they would, you know, not die <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> well, look at look at pear trees. I mean, they they take up a significant amount of water uh, just growing all the pears that they do for Harry and David. And obviously, do you guys Harry have any data on water uptake in an aquaponic system for like? So so like the per, okay per so area? the. So the, the misquote that's often thrown around is it uses 95% or 90% less water. None, there's no data to support that. Um, uh, that's, that's a that's misquote, like of, that's a misquote like of James Ricosi talked about it when he was on my show. It was a misquote of something that he said a long time ago. Um, I have found in my cannabis growing compared to soil controls and we did side by sides, we were able to use um, about 18% of the water, um, not, you know, 5%, you know, or 10% of the water. Uh, it was at 18% um, of, uh, of what it would take to do a full soil run out in an outdoor um, in terms of keeping that plant healthy because the water is just recirculating. So you're only losing, um, you know, a very small percentage to evaporation where there is open surface area, which you can minimize. And you can also 
the, on the only other place that you're going to lose water is by bio uptake. So the plant's physically using it for making biomass. That, that, well, that's the where it's that's, things that you're losing water. I would like to see that side by side, like a four by four AP dual root zone, properly covered system right next to a four by four soil, properly mulched, real thick ass, nice shit, you know, none of the fabric pot bullshit. Um, and, and then measure the water that's going in, put it on a blue mat, the whole thing, and measure both of them, the water that goes in, you know, in, in, a, in aquaponics, you'd measure the water, yeah, the water that goes in. And I'd be really curious because I'd just be really curious. Uh, and I think that, you know, when we were, when I was growing out in Boulevard, California, way up in the Tecate Divide, way out in the desert, way on the edge of the far eastern edge of uh, San Diego County. Um, we did wicking beds and that was the best way to grow out there in the heat because it could get 115 out there and those plants would drink but with the aquaponics the water was getting too hot because of the plumbing and, and everything else so we ended up just switching over it just in those ultra extreme heat environments to, to wicking beds because of the you know just their their ability to adapt to that seemed to be much better uh, and then not only that as long as they had that unlimited water supply they might look a little stressed out, but they certainly don't look anything like a potted plant or a plant in the ground would look like. Can you speak to that? Sorry, I'm, I'm asking you a lot of questions, but because um, like uh, in my 1500 gallon tank there that I just showed you, it's black. It's yeah. currently uncovered, uh, which I would like to cover it, obviously, from the sun. Um, but I'm yeah, also. Otherwise, it's just going to get super hot. Well, you see that question. all the time in Oklahoma. At this point, it hasn't. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool because we well, have we cool had, night. We had we had like 130 degree water coming out of the one last year yeah. in Oklahoma. Okay. So you 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 have to put a sunshade over it. And what what a lot of people do is they'll set up like a sunshade and put like a little turret deck on top of it, and then you have like an overwatch point of your field so that if you you know rippers or something are coming in at night, you can see them plain as day, and you know you got a, a, a well. I'll let you do the math if you have clean line of sight on uh, some rippers. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you, I mean, basically covering it just about any way you can, you know, even if, you know, like, uh, you know, like you were talking about sun shades or whatever. Um, what kind of fish are you, do you have in there? I have koi. Koi? Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to tolerate pretty warm water, but your plants, you know, are not getting. They're not, and they're, they're not. They're, they're, they're not. They're not in that fifteen hundred gallon tank. They're in the pond and in and in my other AP systems. Right. So they're What's they're fine. Um, that those aren't getting hot at all. I mean, in fact, they're still heating at night. You know, because I have a heater on them to keep them keep them to seventy two, and they still heat at night. You know, having cool nights is a huge difference uh, between somewhere that still you know has really warm nights. So obviously, it's very climate specific, but. As long as you're maintaining water temperature, yeah, um, then that's one thing. But you could probably be conserving more water if your tanks were covered. You're probably still losing a lot to evaporation. Totally. Because of your exposed surface area. I do have, since I have, I think I run one, two, three, I run four different small systems. Well, I guess one larger system and three smaller systems. Um, but the one that's like basically completely covered, it's just over the top of like a 150 gallon aquarium. I built it, you know, a few years ago, and it's pretty much entirely covered. There's just one little space where you can like drop food into the fish. It, it conserves water better, better than any of them. Uh, just from my experience in filling the tank, <laughs> you know, I can tell you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, gets way less than my other ones that are have much more open surface area. <laughs> what about uh, plants? Any any uh, legitimate plant? coverage that I like for, for my that I could throw in my pond like obviously there's aquatic plants that do just that sure so so if you're looking for stuff that's really good as far as um uh, uh are you looking for um, I'm for, looking for for water retention in my ponds oh water retention in the ponds uh as far as the walls and stuff or as far as the side no the, 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 the shade the, the whole stuff, up of it right like so for shading for, for shading uh for compost purposes a uh, water lettuce is really good and water hyacinth both water lettuce is better 
but um, if you can get it, but that really is one of the best things that you can get that you can propagate. And if you keep it in an aerated aquarium with a light on it, a grow light on it, you can keep it, you know, in a, in a tub or something, as long as it's got a, you know, a goldfish in there and sits in the corner of your, uh, your house over the winter so that you can reseed it back in the spring. Um, but I used to do that and my dad, my dad had a six car garage and used to wor work on stuff and he had a heated garage for his cars. And I would just set up a little grow uh, 20 gallon tank and a bench in there. And I would bring in my water lettuce at the end of the year as a kid. <laughs> and then we'd throw it back in the pond and we'd propagate it. And as soon as it got warm out in, in the beginning of March, I'd throw it in there and we'd throw some basically an equivalent what my grandma used to make to compost tea uh, in the pond to kind of wake up them. She called it waking up the just waking up all the, the microbes and everything in there. Um, but we make basically what was equivalent to a compost tea where she'd pick certain weeds in the yard and then make a tea out of it. Um, and then those plants would explode in growth and it wouldn't hurt the fish at all, anything like that. And then we would take that and I would take it to the, the pet stores and I would trade that for fish food for all my aquarium fish because my grandfather and I had this huge fish room and, and their canning room, we started take you know going through the the fish or uh, the canning jars and all that, and putting fish tanks on the on the shelves as a kid. That's how I got into fish actually. Uh, with, I was basically going to the aquarium club with my grandpa. Um, so, but this is bringing back old old memories. But um, water lettuce was one of my first things I used to do for money to to trade for either new fish or for fish food at the pet shop. Can you fight it back like? Um, oh yeah, you, you can know, you just I, harvest like it. I, I want to have a little swim area, so could I like rope off, you know, like a swim area? Yeah, and you, you can also just compost it too. Just throw it in your compost with everything else, and and you know, it doesn't hurt anything. It's it's perfectly good nitrifier. It'll it'll help pull excess nitrogen from the system as well. So cool. Do you have uh, anything else cool going on? Is your greenhouse? Uh, Got anything cool going on or anything? It's in flower. Um, it's in dark right now. It's oh, all wrapped up. Um, otherwise, oh. I'd show you that. But I can show you. Um, I'm standing here by a, a little system, which I think I've shown you before. I don't know if I've shown it on the show. You should show everybody to your compost tea brewing set up over on the other building. This, yeah, possible. this is kind of the, this is it. Um, oh, you moved everything. OK. Yeah, well, so there's this. Yeah, this is um, okay. This is I the, see. This now. is the building. Yeah, and this we add, I've added this. Oh and, yeah. This and is so this is where I, there's my uh, stabilized, uh, anaerobically stabilized fish poo poo, but it's got a lot more in there. Um, I dumped a bunch of humic acid in there and a bunch of shit, a bunch of different shits, and I just kind of like let it go and and. Um, so this is my base base nutrients in a lot of ways. I'll pull off a five gallon bucket of this and then I'll put it in this brewer over here and add 95 gallons of water. It's a hundred gallon tank and about six, six ounces of molasses and I'll brew it for 30 hours and then I'll put that in the field. And that's my microbial boom, boom inoculate. And this here is, um, this is just a basic aquaponic system. That this is uh, the reservoir or low point sump tank. There's a pump in there. It pumps up into the radial flow right here, and that's where I will pull off uh, my nutrients, my fish poo. You know, right off of this guy down there. You know, you can see I haven't done it for a few weeks. Um, I've been letting shit build up. I have tiny fish in here right now, and. Um, actually have my water line off so the water is kind of low but to show you how much uh how little water i'm using that i'm i'm down probably 10 15 gallons 20 gallons maybe and i have had my water line off for a week and i filled it up probably six days ago that's not too bad i mean i'm not growing really anything out of it the only thing i'm growing is this this real this one male here and then I have some, uh, um, what is that, wasabi, and just some little shit. I just kind of threw this in here just to have a, a little media filtration. This is a ghetto-ass fucking system. Literally just me finding, like, whatever shit I could to put it together. So, like, don't judge it. This is not mastermind. The, the whole goal here is to harvest poop. This is not to grow fish. This is not to grow plants. It's literally just to keep shit barely alive so I can harvest that poop you know, cause I don't have time or money to build out a dope system 
So I just, and I, and I, I wanted to have wasabi. So I, I ordered some and threw them in there and they're obviously getting bit by pugs and I'm not taking care of it, but, um, it's growing some nice leaves. Honestly, those, these are some really nice leaves. I'm happy with that. And I have a whole rack of, of uh, uh, oh, man down. Man oh, down. man down. Something's not going right. That's not Thanks. good. You guys we, caught me. You just solved the problem. You just caught me. I just solved the problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. Look at that. See, they're not happy. Usually we'll just, like, well, we'll name that one John McAfee. <laughs> yeah. No, wow. they're not happy right now because usually they're just like jamming. See, they want to come up, but they're like, fuck, we're not feeling that great. I think I may have overfed them, honestly. Man, my fish are, are super hungry right now. Like every time we're in veg, you know, the feeding schedule goes way up. And I swear they'll like follow me from end to end on the tank and just like stare at me until I feed them. <clears throat> These guys, my son comes up and puts his hands here and they're just like, nah, 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 nah. they'll just hit your hands usually really hard. They're really accustomed. Um, I haven't had a dead fish in a long time. So that was, that was really not something expected you guys that's a bummer that's but a i totally time. did i totally did dump a ton of food in there this i was like oh that was way too much i'm gonna slip my hand so fuck that's embarrassing yeah. but that's that's uh, what happens i have a little ph meter on there that keeps the ph adjusted i have um a water heater back here it's ghetto but it's controlled you know so yeah I keep it at 72 um I guess it's not that controlled if I got fish dead. I'm not, you know, I'm not checking my shit. You know, I dump a little bit of calcium and a little bit of iron in every month or so. Honestly, just kind of enough. Like, oh, that plant isn't growing that fast. Um, yeah. So maybe kind of a lame share when I have that fish dead. That's all good. Do stab it man. So somebody came in and killed that fish before the show. They were like, we're going to fuck with uh, they shut this the motherfucker. Off. They shut the cameras off and then they killed him. Yeah, shitty. Anyways, um, what else is going on? I'm really just... Uh, <laughs> John McAfish didn't kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so what uh, what cultivars do you got going right now? I got a ton, a ton uh, in the greenhouse. There's a bunch of root beer, GMO root beer um, from Mean Gene that I'm really stoked on. There's it's a whole plethora of stuff. It's uh, all the, every, every plant I own is in there. Um, and they're about week four in flower. Um, there's Bicket, there's Caramelone, there's cocaine hippos, there's Hollywood Pier Kush, there's Black Wap Gold, um, Black Wap Fruit, I got Ethiopian, uh, Congo, Roberts Creek Congo, uh, some coffee in there, some pink lemonade, Cherry OG, GMO. Uh, I got some stuff from Brandon Russ, some Lima Rilla, and sorry, I have to roll my eyes up to remember everything and walk through there. There's the Lima Rilla, um, the, the Death Breath, and Sour Cheeseberry, and then that, those are all clones. There's probably some more in there. Peanut Butter Jealous, Dog Walker, um, Piho, Catholic Schoolgirl. A black lime reserve, a big old black lime reserve that's probably 10 feet tall um, by like, you know, six feet around. It's a big, big girl. I'm really excited about. And then there's a bunch of, of seed stock in there, a bunch of my seed stock. And um, I got a uh, Cali mist in there. I've been I've been dumping a bunch of pollen. So, I, you know, I made I remade it uh, the next generation of the Cali mist, which I'm really hyped on that I got from AK Bean Brains. Um, I want to take that and put that into the ATF. Um, I'm really excited about that. Um, I got some uh, white haze, cross A5 haze, cross uh, a Thai BX that I'm excited about. I remade a generation of that. And I also put, what else did I put on there? 
maybe the root beer, maybe the root beer GMO just to fuck around. Um, I got some sour, um, what does he call it? It's a uh, lime one BX cross uh, the sour. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I don't know. So I'm just listing off shit. I'm walking through the room, but um, there's a ton of stuff in there. I've been making, dropping a lot of pollen and um, it's been fun. I guess since it spotlighted me anyway, uh, what are your favorite terps? Like what are your favorite um, smells and kind of flavors in that room? Um, I like gas, I, I, you know, is, is really my main driver. Um, the black, black wop gold is the one coming in the strongest right now. So we're week four. Um, it's coming. It's super strong. It, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to get it out in people's hands. Uh, maybe it's a bad name. Um, it probably is. Um, but, um, it's really fucking legit, really strong. And, um, yeah, the other one that's really sparked my, I just got that was that pink lemonade I mentioned from Kaya. He handed me that one. And, um, it's just like you, like, it's like red Robin pink lemonade. You know, we're just like, give me that fucking bottomless pink lemonade and fries. That's totally what it smells like. And, and it's uh, pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And I guess it, 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 uh, drops like 7%, uh, you know, whole plant fresh frozen. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's pretty, pretty epic. Um, I love the, the Carmelone and cocaine hippos, the GMO and the Bicket, um, which my buddy Nick, you know, bred. Um, it's a cherry pie GMO, sort of an accidental breeding he did, but he pulled out the, the cut and um, it's, it's stable and he's passed it around a little bit, but it's, um, whew, it's something outrageous. Like, right, it's right, I have it right next to the GMO and it's pulling like stronger GMO terps huh. than, than the GMO with the, I can smell just a little bit of that cherry cherry in there. So that's really high. I'm really hyped on that. Um, and uh, the, the, the other thing, so I got uh, last year about this time, I got, um, I just sold, sold these seeds. I put them, the F2s on. I got, um, I'm calling it Larry Chimes. I got from Kevin, Kevin Jodry. Um, um, it's a cherry pie, cherry west. Cherry Pie S1 on Cherry West on a Lime 1 BX, which is a bunch of mean gene stuff. It has an unknown male in there. Um, and I went through a, a, bun- a batch of about 800 um, this winter. And um, I found some really cool stuff. So I'm rerunning about 20 of those to kind of find some some different, you know, be really honing on the selections because it was it's so wonderful. It's so gassy. There's cherry, there's lime, there's cherry lime, there's, there's like almost like burnt cherry candy flavor. There's a new car smell. There's the bread, cherry bread, like pie crusty smell. Um, there, there's just a ton there. And I've done some breedings with, with some of this shit. And um, so I'm excited to look at that again. Were the highs stable on that whole like 800? Uh, like what was, was there any stability in that 800 seed kind of run? Or was it all? Just- uh, yeah, with the, with the stability was the gas and the cherry for sure. Gas, cherry, lime. Like everything had that. And, and that's why it was like, honestly, one of the harder sifts I've done because it was so locked in on that cherry. I was, che- is a cherry pie S1 on the cherry West, which is a cherry, which was the cherry S1 BX. So it's like a lot of cherry pie in there and then a little bit of lime and then this unknown male. And that's, that that's the people that's, that was kind of a big thing. Cause uh, there, 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 I mean, there, there was, uh, there's Hermes in there for sure. There's early Herms that came and then there's some that came late. Um, I pulled, I, and I beat them up pretty hard with tarps and holes and tarps and shit. And, um, I pulled all those out, you know, so for what it's worth it, that, that stuff is still in the line. Um, you know, we all know cherry pie struggles with mm-hmm. that, but it's one of those that, um, willing to deal with you know for for me anyways not maybe not everyone else is and, and so I, I my my thought in it is and maybe i'm naive is that if i beat it up enough um and, and pull the plants that, that that meet my requirements that don't have any of the, those traits that i can keep moving forward and eventually i'll work that out maybe i will maybe i won't we'll see cool to have that many numbers or that that big of a number sift you know what i mean like instead of i don't know 100 plants or 50 plants or 20 yeah. plants, 800 holy cow yeah, yeah I, I, that's most of what i've been doing 
like the black wop gold i found out at 1200 um so i i did last two three years i i did these big n- number runs and found some really great genetics that worked in my my hard climate and and now I'm trying to apply them in, 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 into my, I've applied them into my stuff. And now I'm looking at that. And, and this year I'm not doing as big a numbers because um, I'm trying to look at stuff that I've made. So I'm doing about 72. I'm doing a tray of everything, 72. Um, and then if I, as I find stuff that I really like, I'm going to all go back into it, you know, next summer and, and open up big populations of it and look for heroes. I, I, I just kind of believe that in that, concept you know and so far it's it's proven to be true and the, the number the ones that i've done big sifts of i found stuff you know because I, the way i'll do it is i don't know how, how anyone else does it you know i, I really don't I'm, I'm learning how to do this i'm i'm a, you know pretty much a novice i'll say you know novice is maybe not the right term but whatever i'll stack them up into, into the flavor profiles you know as i'm stacking around the plants and 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 then i'll work through those over and over again until I, you know, come back to them. And eventually like that one is the strongest one smelling one. And then, uh, and then I can tag all that and then work through and get to smoke it, you know? And so on the cherry pies, we did all that. We tagged all the flavors. We tagged all the smells. We brought them all and dried them, cured them. I mean, it's a lot of work when you're like, you know, like narrowing it down to 20, 30 plants, you know, out of 800. It's, it's, so that's why I was like, fuck this. Yeah, like, just something. Yeah, at like some point, I just like, I just said, fuck it. Plant. My nose is blown the fuck out. I'm going to rerun these, these again before I, I decide to cull anything. I'm, I'm too, you know, it's too much, you know, it was just too fucking much for me. I think so. You, in a good uh, way, in a good way. No, I know, yeah. I know what you mean, mm-hmm. but it, it's like, it's too much, it's like too much wine or too much champagne or something. You're complaining, but I mean, you're not complaining. Uh, I was going to say, are you a big fan of the outliers when you look at that, like 800 plant sip? Like, do you like to look at the plant that's unlike other plants in some way, or do you like to look at the plant that's best of those the plants? Like it's an outlier by being the best or something. Um, probably the best. It, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a relative term, but like, you know, I, I think back to, uh, Last summer, I did a, a cool run of a Gorilla Glue Mac. And it was like, okay, there's the Gorilla Glues. There's the Macs. That's a really cool Gorilla Glue. That's a really cool Mac. That's a really cool Gorilla Glue Mac. Who the fuck are you? You know, who the fuck are you? And there's like six purple ones, you know? And so, like, I saved those seeds. I, and I, I grabbed the males that had the purple and I put them back on. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what the fuck that is. It's a cool, wild-ass flavor you know i don't even know how to describe the flavor it's none of the above um but i was at the same time i was so and i'm so like excited about that gorilla glue mac flavor you know and so i went i ended up like getting more excited about that while i'm sitting on those seeds you know when you brought that up that's what came to my what came to mind is like those seeds are sitting there and i gotta pop those purple seeds you know because they're something cool you know but i was i'm really just like i'm driven by my mouth you know and it obviously has to be really high you know, really potent because I smoke a lot and I'm in a ton of pain, but I'm really driven a lot by my, the mouth feel and how, how, yeah, and how I just the, like the gas, you, you basically said all gas, all gas, all gas. And you've said before that you're in a ton of pain. A lot of people that have basically pain issues are really desperately into that gas basically. Above yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I actually consume an incredible amount of weed. Same plan. It, it, nothing to fuck with, man. That's true. <laughs> Although we know the original Wu Tang Clan, so maybe they would fuck with the Wu Tang. It doesn't seem wise to do it, but Wu Tang Clan, Wu Tang Clan. Look at that. This is the Wu Tang Clan, man. I wonder what's the indoctrination procedure for the Wu Tang Clan, Steve? What do you think? I don't know. Oh, you gotta, sure you gotta use uh, malted barley, malted barley, <laughs> milled malted, milled malted barley. Coot would know. Coot could tell us the initiation. I had a question because uh, I didn't want to interrupt Mr. Uh, Trump the other evening. And because the question was based on my ignorance or lack of understanding on KNF in general. But one of uh, the gentlemen that's been on Fume's sh- uh, show several times asked about uh, IMO3 and IMO4. And I'm going to assume something that I am at least stands for indigenous microbes. Is that correct? Or? Yep. Yep. 
And, and but what does that mean in terms of IMO three and IMO four? So yeah, so here's the process. Um, it's uh, it's it's very it's similar in some ways to how Elaine, uh, Doctor Ingham, would collect microorganisms out of the wild. I don't know if you've heard heard her talk about it, but she'll go out. And Excuse she'll me. Do... I've had twenty years of her bullshit. <laughs> uh, okay. I know all about her and her company, Earth Fart, down in Corvallis. I've been to better dumps. That's not her. That's here. not her. That's, that's, uh, that, I mean, that, that, that I know that's that Matt. I, yeah, yeah, Matt Slaughter. And yep. yeah, and I, and I know Tad Hussey and the father Leon Hussey. And yeah. Um, Elaine, I'm, Elaine, have you met Elaine before? No. She okay. kicked me out of one of her seminars for asking well, a simple question. Uh, she's a sweet lady. I've spent a ton of time with her, and um, I, don't I hope think you didn't. I, I hope you didn't pay her ten thousand dollars to get a shake and bake course. Fun, fun fact: me and me and Josh took Elaine to her first dispensary trip. Yeah, no, she's 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 cool, man. I, I honestly think that you guys would get along, like kicking it, you know, face to face, and you guys would have some. It would be a great conversation. So I found myself as putting put on this conference and i want to talk to you uh, offline about this um about the conference and everything but but my it, it turned out that i kind of realized my goal was to stir shit up it really mm-hmm. was like 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 scott granola came out to the conference the first year um and i i, I think i even made, was about to connect you and i was like oh man i'm gonna fucking blow. this was the year when you guys were fighting and tad was it was the that that year when I started the conference and I was like, I'm going to blow the fucking plate thing up. If I invite Coot and Scott Granola, they might arm wrestle or some shit, you know, <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I, you know, also having, having Chris Trump and, and Elaine together, it was, it was really awesome because I, I got to sit at, when we were at dinner, I got to poke them a little bit and be like, what about this? What about this? And so, to answer your question, to get back to your question, I, I feel like I'm actually really qualified to answer this because I've spent a bunch of personal time with them. I've taken both their courses full on. Um, I'm, I, I, I lean mostly in what the way I, I grow my garden. I, I lean in soil food web concepts. Um, so, so to explain IMO, and that's what the, that's why I started there was because I've, I've listened and I've, I've learned so much from her. Um, IMO one is a collection on rice of microorganisms. Okay. No, no. Let let me just go through it. Let me give me. I know, but let me just explain something. I'm not, I'm not, uh, what's the word? I'm not a complete newbie. Having studied. No, I'm not talking about Karandang's work. And while the methods may be different, the goals were the same. The creation of calcium phosphate, um, the fish thing. Um, a number of areas, but what here was the question. The question from this guest uh, uh, in the no, he was on the show. I'm sorry, uh, but he's been on uh, Fumes uh, program several times, and he's a, a breeder of and what have you. But he said, relative to Coots' soil approach to soil, where do, does that place in? The IMO thing, and he said somewhere between IMO. You correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but you tell him because I'm going to get that wrong because I wasn't following the conversation. Somewhere in between the, the thing, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, like, could, yeah, and I, I could see. So, so like, um, I, I I'm a IMO one. You collect the microorganisms. I know you understand it, but let me just walk through it so I can feel like I, like we're all okay. on the same page. Uh, okay. IMO one. You collect the microorganisms on rice. IMO2, you put in sugar, and the sole mm-hmm. purpose of sugar is, is nothing to do with, with its benefit, just to dry out the micro, microorganisms and make them shelf stable. You're literally okay. just drying them out, right? And, and putting them, so you, you could do this with any other method, but that's the, the goal, is right. not to add sugar to the system. It's to put them on a shelf stable thing. And then when you go to make your IMO3, you ideally have a shelf full of uh, a collection from the fall, summer, winter, spring for five years or so you have this massive collection of these imos you know that are Mm -hmm. shelf stable and so when you go to make your imo3 you add an assortment of all these things 
the, and then and then you grow out those microorganisms on a carbon and a carbohydrate. Very basic. So this is basic composting. You're literally just reproducing what you've captured. In these inoculating. Environments. You're inoculating your material. You're inoculating and growing it out, just like you would with mushrooms or any, anything else. Okay. When, and so that's to IMO3. And then IMO4, you take the, so you take the, the soil for the garden that you want to plant in, the, the native soil, and you mix that in half, half and half. And, and what the way they teach it is that you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're helping the both microbe sets kind of get used to each other, which is, is, a, is, a, is I don't, it, that scientifically doesn't make sense, but that's the way they kind of, they, they talk about it. Well, and then when, here was the basis of my question, okay? Because what this gentleman was saying, so, because uh, Chris said, I don't know what the coop mix is, could you tell me? And so I did. I explained the two-year process to make the worm castings. Two years. Um, right. That accumulation of microbes. Blah 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 blah. You know, and right. the, the other, uh, you know, whatever organisms that are in the soil. Uh, hopefully, I always laugh. People go, "I got mites in my soil." Good. You want that? I mean, you got mites on your skin. It has nothing to do with red spider mites, for Christ's sake. You know. Um, so when uh, when I told Chris what was in it, including that horrible stuff, neem. Ooh, gosh. You know that causes inverted nipples and testicular uh, droppings, and you know just uh, swollen colons. And you know it's the end of humanity as we know it. And then, of course, uh, the stuff now, I guess, uh, I'm always amused. You can use the fish from the ocean, but you don't want to use the kelp from the ocean because it's radioactive or, you know, I don't know, it's, there's some uh, yada, yada, yada. So when I told him what I had in it, he said, wow, you know, he was, gave me a compliment. That's really, you know. So then this question came up relative to IMO3 and 4. And that's when he said what he did, that he would put that type of a soil recipe or, for, you know, uh, creation up in that area. So does that mean it's good or, or so, does that mean it needs? So, uh, so Josh, yeah. he's asking, so Josh, he, the Chris was saying or someone was saying, could you use Coots Mix for IMO3 or IMO4 for, for adding, for bulking out for the microbes? Mm. No, 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 because Coots Mix is a full and complete um, soil. And, I, and, and to be clear, I've made that. My, that's what my, well, I should, I should clarify there. I made what I thought was Coots Mix in my greenhouse. The top 12 inches of soil was what I thought was Coots Mix. And I think that's really the, the deal with all of this stuff. All, after having spent time, you know, I haven't spent as much time with you, um, Jim, um, as I have with some of these with with Chris and Elaine. But really, because like my goal is to fucking get your truth. You know what I mean? I don't give two fucks about anybody's anything. I am trying to grow the most flavorful, most potent cannabis. Right. And so I will will, will, will spend time with any everybody around whether they disagree with each other, because I'm just trying to get to that goal. And so that that kind of actually put me in a, in a in a good spot to put on the conference because my goal is just to get to, to truth, you know. In that, I just lost pay, lost my fucking. No, I went on my stoner tangent. You, you know what you should do? You should do it. So in Jamaica, they always have like boxing matches at the agricultural expo. You could just have like it could be like chess boxing where like there's a boxing round and then they each have like 15 minutes to say their piece on a scientific thing and then like another boxing round. <laughs> so 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 well when IMO3, when, uh, IMO3 is not a soil. It it is an inoculant. Okay. It's more similar to compost to a to a complete compost. And by right. the time you get to IMO5, you are at the same place you are biologically as you are with Elaine's soil compost if that if even though you've come to it at a different angle you can you you can you can make the same thing this is my my personal 
deal, you know, belief after, after cranking it out with both of them. Um, and I believe that you did the same thing with, 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 with your soil base. And so what I was trying to say was, I thought I made your soil base, but I very clearly heard you just say two year old worm castings. I did not use two year old worm castings. And so th there's some, some serious power in there in, in that the, the microbes have had times to really work that material over and really make available all the minerals and nutrients and like time and microbes is huge. And so I lean, lean towards, uh, I don't do a lanes style where it's like a 20 day compost turning thing. I buy shit compost, uh, compost that is not finished from, from local people. And I let them, I let it finish. And as it cools okay. down, I add stuff to it. Go ahead. Let me give you a real easy uh, way to get to your goal a lot faster. You can take an agricultural waste product, which is spent fruiting blocks from commercial mushroom growers, and you use that, the mycelium, versus uh, the bacteria, protozoa, and what have you that we do in compost. You're still going to reintroduce that. But the mycelium of Paul Stamets really did mycology a favor when he named one of his most, I think, required reading really for farmers and anybody. But mycelium running, that's really the great. And when you were talking about right. using wood, what you sounded like to me is a, a kind of a form of hugel culture with the uh, wood uh, bed a layer but you can use uh, mycelium to your advantage even there because um if you inoculate that wood as you after you put the chips down and do whatever you're going to do as far as arranging and then inoculate with uh, even oyster mushrooms you don't have to get it too exotic uh i mean there's a lot of variety and here's the beauty you can buy the spawn you can buy this bond from like Paul Stamets. And since you're in the Northwest, there's an advantage there to buying your spawn from a local producer. And that is that those uh, strains that you're going to get will Are be activated. acclimated to your yeah, situation. Um, but I just want to be clear. I don't do any, I mean, I just let the worms do it. And, um, you know, I like the I I mean okay. Elaine speaks high I, I'm about the worms. Elaine speaks highly about the worms. Nothing bad passes through the worms gut. You well know. they're also I mean they've been used uh, in in uh, directly. Uh it was a uh something that was witnessed, but in they've been used in India for soil remediation for several millennia. Spent farmlands could be rejuvenated by uh, adding massive amounts of uh, worm poop, for lack of, you know, um, to the soil. And it also neutralizes contaminants. Uh, that's always a good thing. Uh, but I, I want to be real clear. For some reason, this uh, individual really has, I believe, and I mean this sincerely, really has some serious mental health issues, Scotty Granola, is now quoting that I work for nutrient companies. I would have to say that if you're going to criticize me, it's that I've slammed every product I can think of <laughs> and, and then some. Okay. Yeah. No, All that's, right. I, I would agree with that assessment. Like I'm, I'm sitting here <laughs> online trying to defend a lane, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, and, and I've been around, I've been around cannabis for 50 years, but, Around this uh, thing that started down at Oregon State, you know, well, go Beavers. Can I, can I say this? Like, uh, this is one thing I love Elaine dearly, and I've had to, you know, um, she when she didn't understand what KNF was, and I don't, mm -hmm. she still she still doesn't quite understand it fully, it, it, because she's got this like. Um, you know, like this thing where you, if you've been so focused and, and yelling and no one's been listening to you for so long, it, you know, she's kind of almost got earmuffs on and like repeating her thing. 
you know, but I, we really had to get into it with, with Chris and her and me and, and, and Layton on many drives, uh, you know, like explaining what this is. And, and after, after she finally understood, it's like, Oh, this is very similar to what I'm doing. And I feel like that's a lot of the problem is, is like not hearing each other fully. You know, not to okay. oversimplify. Let it. me give you. Let me give you and, an and, example. And, and, but she, but she's guilty of what she does is she hears something, she simplifies it, and then trashes it. And she's yeah. done that with the K and F. And I and I think with the name thing, that's that's like that's literally what I think has happened. Like just trashing without understanding and digging into what 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 you're talking about, what is going on there. That's that's right, my, let me, my let me just let me just this is Which is shitty. just one set one simple example was at a seminar under the auspices of the School of Horticulture at Oregon State. So this was sanctioned. This, okay. And she was giving a, a presentation. And she said, almost verbatim, that rock dust, rock dust was a luxury. And that it really didn't have a serious role to play in soil biology. And here's my complaint is that you talk to any, any legitimate soil scientist and they will tell you that soil is nothing more than rotted animal and plant material in shattered rock. Usually right. via, okay, that's, you can't change, you know, what, billions of years of no, history. No, she's not, like she teaches that it's all from the rock. She teaches that. So it's, she's, she's, you know, and like, whatever, it'd be better for her to defend herself. But like, I think that she's just like, literally just like, like is used to fighting this fight with the, not realizing that like, sometimes you're talking to someone that's on your team, you know? And, and like, what, like maybe she's getting crazy about rock dust because uh, of, of folks who have gotten too crazy about the, 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 the need to add rock dust and, and like emphasize that too hard um you know I, I, or she's just I, she's just okay over, over, over like it what's the, what was the dude the, the, there was an argument back in the 80s with, with was it tim uh you know what i'm talking about the, the guy who territorial dude territorial seeds down there in oregon oh uh yeah the guy that wrote uh, uh gardening west of the cascades and he, yeah, went, he, he went all yeah. deep into mineral, minerals and she went all deep into biology. And her point is, in her th philosophy, is that the, the biology can convert all the minerals. And that's where you need to go after compost and, and, and biological driven. And, other, and, and then this other folks have been more about the mineral driven. And I'm like, in, I, I am in the middle. I'm like, make your compost and add minerals. Test it and add minerals. Tim Wilson, there you go. No, it's not Tim Wilson. It, uh, it's, um, what's this guy's name? That they ran territorial. Um, Solomon. Solomon. Hey, Solomon. Yeah. Yep. She's Solomon. Yeah, and he. Okay. Now, what's interesting about him is that after he sold the territorial deal to the current owners, he had purchased it. He didn't found it. I mean, that's not a criticism. I'm just trying to give you the history. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah. he owned it for this period of time, and then when he retired, he moved to Australia. And then set up one of the most extensive science, biology, and botany libraries. You had to become a, this is like we're talking mm, like 98, 99. So over 20 years, about 22 years ago. And so a lot of things were different with regard to protocols and how you uh, transferred files. And uh, PDF was relatively, wow, that's pretty cool, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, but all I'm saying is that he went on to do some really, really great things. And when he got to a point, he was here in the States about four years ago and contacted me through uh, Tad Hussey at uh, Kiss Organics and about the bad state of genetics in Australia. And so he knew that I had some whatever, old stuff, whatever you want to call it. And so anyway that and uh but even he and i i mean like right there i mean his thing was all about livestock Ca calcium carbonate calcium carbonate calcium carbonate and 
I'm the other side of it. I'm a hundred percent. I mean, yeah, I understand. You got to give credence. Well, never mind. Um, but using basalt as the rock dust. If you want calcium, a lot of people aren't aware of this. They don't factor it in. But worm castings are literally covered with a calcium carbonate slime. That's uh, so. You, that's why worm casting people are never whining about pH or running around in circles doing God knows what to some kind of cow mag thingy that I still haven't wrapped my brain around. I'm not sure how adding sulfur corrects uh, cow mag, but whatever. So no, I'm it, just saying. It's, and, that's and one it, of my. We always need more cow mag. We were talking about that in the chat. That's earlier. one of my weak points in, in my I'm gardening. Sure. And, and every time I talk to you, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm reminded of it and guilty. And I'm like, set out after the conversation and i'm gonna go fucking get some worms going and i never fucking do man um it's it, it's something i really need to put some energy into you know because just like you, you, you want to make you want to in the mushroom you want to make money think about this of the kind of castings i'm talking about and there's only maybe four on the entire west coast from the canadian border down to the mexican border that produce this level of castings $400 a yard. That's 27 bags. That's half a pallet. $400. Yeah, yeah. And, you, okay, if you had, you never will, but you got to understand this part, given their reproductive rate. A pound of worms today would be a 1,000 pounds a year from today. Now, you're never going to achieve perfection, but uh, but each worm, they're homorphodetic, but it takes two to tango. They line up. They exchange body fluids, and each worm produces, on average, 1.3 cocoons a week. Within six weeks, those hatch, they hatch, and then those hatchlings um, will be sexually mature in another six weeks. But in the meantime, they're still processing bacteria manure. They're working 24-7 and will for five years. They don't call in sick. I mean, the best workers you'll ever have. Um, but think about that. I mean, you do some large windrows where, let's say you run, okay, let's go a, a hundred feet. That's big. That's a really big windrow. And let's say you're going three feet high. So that's going to be, I can't do the arithmetic, but a, at least four truckloads. So we're, I'm going to call it 160 yards at $400, no employees. No, no, uh, uh, what do you call it? Production manager. No, nobody in charge of the clones. If you ever get down around Portland, let me know and I'll meet you at one of the top places on the West Coast, right there off the uh, 205. I know him, man. I know I've been there, but that's where I started my thing. I, I, I was from there. I'm from there. Uh, oh, you got the best. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best. <laughs> No, yeah. When I, when I learned to grow weed, I met a, 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 a gentleman, um, Barry Joe, in, in in Portland, and he taught me. Uh, he brought me down to what's it called? It starts with an S. Um, that place that you're talking about. I'm for, I'm blanking on the name. Oh no, I'm talking about uh, Northwest Redworms. Oh, Northwest Redworms. I thought you were talking about the uh, the concentrates. Oh, concentrates. concentrates. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, he, he brought me down to concentrates and he like gave me a recipe. Yeah. And it was, and it was, and that's, I've been going on that since, uh, you know, whatever, 2000, early 2000s. You know, they're the largest uh, organic farm store in the uh, Northwest. As a matter of fact, some of their stuff they were grandfathered in because they carried it when nobody else would many years ago, like kelp. So if you buy kelp up in Seattle, maybe it didn't physically come through concentrates, but they get the right. fingerprint it, as the expression goes. Gotcha. Uh, no, uh, wasn't in the the worm guy? Wasn't he over in Washington, like Washougal area? No, this guy is. You know, he was in Camas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I went up and saw yeah. him. So when I lived in Portland, I went up and met him and saw his beds and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he got really big. Now he's like a major producer of uh, black soldier fly uh, larva. 
or whatever they're called. Uh, there's one company that caters to the uh, retail, excuse me, um, reptile scene, and they yep. they call them Phoenix worms. So I don't know, but anyway, yeah, we the Black Soldier Fly deal, and he also does another one. He has a product made with mealworms, some kind of a a chitin thing. Yeah, I was his first customer, the first guy they ever answered and had in Craigslist went over to a bucket to get some worms. He wasn't doing castings then. His uh, business model was going to, he was going to sell worms and worm bins. Well, you know, um, I, like, I don't know, this is maybe as a weird transition, but um, I, I like, I, I'm just, you know, like anybody else figuring out how to do their shit. And, um, I, I've got this website that I started and I, and I want to, I sell genetics and seeds and that's what I'm, I'm focusing on is breeding. And, but I also am starting to, I'm, I want to start adding products like things that I I'm making locally, basically like compost and, and worm castings and, um, lactobacillus and different things like that. And, um, just as a way to make things available. I don't know. Like I've, I don't think there's that, 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 that a whole lot of really great product. There. there isn't there's and i'm a, not there's trying to do anything dirt. huge but i like no. so something micro where i could like give someone an inoculant you know even if it was like only a pound you know to, they could inoculate their compost pile you know type thing or you know i i can and would be willing to show you with documentation how to set up a worm operation on an acre that would gross you at least five hundred thousand a year and nothing, and not forget worms. I mean, you can sell those, but that's a lot of work. Yeah. Harvesting the worms. Um, because forget cannabis, they're going to do whatever they're going to do. But you mentioned uh, what used to be called truck farming, and now it's called uh, market, market farming. Yeah. yeah the week, weekend, like farmer's market, that, that type of grower. What's interesting is that those people, are really focused on improving not only the, the uh, nutrient density of the food that they offer their clients, but also the flavor, the aromas. Okay, it's amazes to me that all these things around the world are all dependent upon soil. Coffee, right? The best coffee is like Kona, right? Or whatever. Or in, in Europe, it's the, the areas that have the volcanic soils for the best wines, you know? Why is it in cannabis? No, it's just bottled, man. All you got to do is get some of this zippity zap and it's only, you know, $900 a gallon and you can reach dank them. I mean, it's absurd. Dank them. Like, you know, yeah. D-U-M-B. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just it boggles my mind. But people like you and Chris are making a real effort <laughs> in a direction that, and see it produces results instead of just, Hey, how can I hook my wagon to this money train? I still well, laugh that, at anybody gets on a screen and starts begging not, for honestly, a Patreon. Doesn't everybody know Coot, Coot gets 50% of, of all the proceeds. Anytime someone sells anything called Coot's mix, he's got this royalty thing where like, he's got yeah, like right. weed mafia enforcers, Sasquatch comes and, breaks both your legs well yeah. no and honestly like that like um i when i did the conference like i still don't let anybody come in and do vendors or yeah. any of that shit like in, in people that i love and respect like they're like oh i want to be involved i'm like there's really no way for you for you to be involved like it's literally me yeah like yeah, i make the right. phone calls to the speakers like there's nothing else that's to do right. because we don't do sponsors we don't do shit like i need someone to take tickets at the door you know, you want to help do that, <laughs> but, 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 the, but yeah. the point, I guess what I'm saying is like, uh, at the same time, I'm kind of looking at all these market farmers and I'm, I'm, I'm building this, all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I feel like I, there's some things that I feel good about selling and I, I would like to like put them out and make them available. And so I'm kind of like timid about it because your, I don't want to... they are your best teachers. They ha get their hands dirty. They actually are doing it, not this bullshit, you know, looking like a frat boy. And, uh, well, I don't smoke that stuff. I just, eat, I just do concentrates, you know. 
uh, some candy ass, and, you know, show me guys smoke flowers, you know, some really hardcore shit, not this, whatever this crap is. No, it's in a gun. You'll like it. No, I won't. You know, it, cartridges. I mean, really? That's what it came to? That's what it's come down to is you stick it in a yeah. gun and, I mean, come on. Hot dog water. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I don't get it. And everything in Washington, else. They're having a big fight in Washington. Have you heard about this? Uh, a number of years ago, these these motherfuckers. The, we, so we were like one of the first states, right? Sure. So I And I'm from Washington. But at the time when they legalized, I was living in Minnesota and I was market vegetable farming. Uh, uh -huh. Tomatoes, peppers to, to rest, restaurants. And <clears throat> anyways, I got word the shit was legalized. I'm, I came rushing home, you know. Like I told you, I lived in Oregon. That was prior to all this stuff. And I came yeah. rushing home and set up a medical thing and uh, looked at the laws and was like, OK, every, just like everybody else, this recreational thing doesn't pan out. There's way too much tax. And look at this medical thing that still works. It's been going on for 20 years. It's gone. Did that. Did that. Yeah. So so it, my point is, long story, that the, the, the 502 people, the people who got the recreational licenses, I'm yeah. one of them. Those yeah. people... Uh, lobbied against medical they killed medical yeah i, I watched i literally watched it happen in the legislative videos i like watched every one of them because i was so involved and so scared about where i was going to go and and then i turned directions and i bought a license for seventy five thousand dollars to to play in the recreational game and i've yeah. spent the last six years of my life just totally invested in in this thing that has made me nothing cost me a ton and 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 these people were so desperate to make money when they saw hemp coming, they they oh. had it. They, they they lobbied for a law to allow because because they're two separate things to allow themselves to buy CBD to buy hemp product and and then process it and then sell it through the five hundred two system through the regulated tax system. Yeah, they made a law for that, and that's that's all good and fair because I I own both a recreational license and a hemp license on my property. And a medical yeah. license. I have all three. So I can grow hemp. I can sell it to myself and to my recreational. And I can test it. I can process it, do everything that I'm supposed to do. And I can sell it at a store. And I've done so. And that's really cool. Other motherfuckers. Hold on, hold on. This is where I'm getting to the yeah. good part. The other motherfuckers who are much more loaded than me and much more yeah. greedy were like, we're going to buy that motherfucking shit by the pallet for get for nothing. We're going to yeah. hire some guy for $200,000 a year in a lab to convert the CBD to TH, whatever the fuck we want. And yeah. we're going to put it in shit and we're going to make a bunch of money. Right. And we're like, God damn sure. God. And, and in my mind, I'm like, God damn right. You are. That's what you were supposed to do. You were the asshole that was supposed to do that. Do that thing, motherfucker. Like do that and do that horrible thing. Because as soon as you do that, is as soon as the world realizes that you are the McDonald's that is killing us. And then yeah. I am producing this like ho nice, wholesome, organic, oh, whatever, you wait, like you, healthy you, product. And, and but, but, but here's my, here's the point of my story. The same motherfuckers who put me out of business in my medical are now arguing. They, they also argue to add the CBD in are now arguing to cut the CBD out. Because oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's like their whole fucking energy is just in arguing people out of their game. That's their like it's like the craziest thing in the world. Like that's their whole game is to argue people out of their game. You know, the politicians in Oregon looked north to Washington and saw the mess that the whole five oh two thing caused. You know, a lot of people, especially medical card holders, a lot of grief. So here's how they killed it in Oregon. They didn't even have to have a debate or pass the law. They added it to the uh, recreational cannabis law that every household in Oregon could have four plants. And oh. why would you go get a card? Why would you, you know, pay, what is it, $200 a year to grow four, you know, six plants? Kiss me. I can, you know, give me four plants and I know you don't like them, but 800 gallon uh, smart pots yeah. and uh, we can, we can rock and roll, you know? <coughs> sure. There's no nothing in the law about how big your plants have to be or can't be. Right, 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 yeah. right, right. No, I know yeah. you can crank ten pounds out of a plant and make some money. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, just yeah. But you know, it's, it's sad though. 
look, a, a friend of mine has been involved in the commercial before and after it was legal for at least 15 years. And he gave me a really sage piece of advice. He's a lot, a lot younger, about half my age. He said, you don't get it. I have to grow what people want to buy. And people want to buy the stuff you laughed at. Okay. And I mean, I'm not really sure that inheritance, genetic inheritance is even studied by some of these people. I mean, some of the combinations, I just go like, why would you do that? It'd be like crossing a sure. professionally trained Watt, Watt, uh, Rottweiler with, uh, you know, Pepe the Chihuahua or something. I, yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to get muscle tone on this Chihuahua. Oh, okay. I don't know. How does a lot of coot? How does a lot of dog breeding go? Like a lot of the Labradoodles, they're apparently hypoallergenic, but they have all kinds of behavioral problems. They die right. like early. They got cancer problems on and on. Like a lot of breeding issues are just, or a lot of breeding programs are just terrible. Like regardless. I want to meet. I want to meet the piece of garbage that started this claim that the cannabis today is so much stronger than it was forty years ago. Who are you talking to? You know, I mean, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Okay, enough. I mean, it's in I the mean, sense that probably most people had pretty swaggy weed, but some people still had train wreck and to and whatever else. Some right. Like weed, but you didn't give to to everybody. You know, people didn't give no. train wreck to everybody. So it's like a lot of yeah. people did have swaggy like Mexican brick weed and stuff. So in that sense, I think a lot of people do have way better weed now. Well, uh, honestly, so, uh, you know, when I came into the game, my first couple of grows were a bust, just like everybody's. But I but I, it was the price was still so high and I was smart enough or you know disciplined enough to just put all the money back into it and go down to the grocery store and say, well, what did I do wrong? How do I fix it? And in, in, this is not what I would teach, you know, whatever, like I've learned a lot since then, but they, yes. they were able, they were able to give me, I was able to buy weed, to buy bottles to grow weed that was, you know, buy enough equipment and bottles and buy the stuff to grow good weed to, to get the high, quiet, pro, you know, high price, geez, God damn it, I can't talk, the high price, you know. Um, I just, I just did a podcast via phone and the whole thing came up about uh, well, all the changes in, in the uh, growth store market. Um, I, I'm sure Seattle is not different than Portland. It's a broom swept through and uh, they went away. Um, and here was my we point. Have, we have one in Bellingham. Right. It's, cra right. it's crazy. Bellingham has more growers per capita than any place in the state. We're kind of like the yeah. Humboldt of Washington. We have one grow store. Yeah. But here was my point. Uh, who cares? They had 40 years. 40 yeah. years of, of just crushing the worst bullshit, you know, known to God. Okay. I mean, general hydroponics, really? I mean, that was one of like the first, first, first grow store companies was there was the Dynagro and uh, General Hydroponics. Uh, that was it. Oh, and this company out of Seattle called. Uh, oh, they import pumps and shit. <coughs> Eco Grow. OK, they were the first one to have a three part, but it, they were smart. It was a powder. So you got a, a grow powder, a flower powder, no pun intended. Uh, flower powder and a trace elements. Wow. So then they had a chart. Now we're talking. Okay. Now you can really goober it up because you got to have the chart and, you know, and although this week I add the blah, blah, blah. And next, you know, just Jesus. So <clears throat> there you go. You want to hear some funny shit? Um, in my learning process, like I, like I, like, you know, I've gone from growing synthetic to you know doing all so sorts did of I. So shit. Did I. i've done, done a bunch of shit so yeah. one of the shits that i did along the way was um i 
was bust, you know, bust broke, which I often am and needing to get through a grow. And so I bought some seabird guano, the really high Peruvian shit. And I, and I actually oh, yeah. learned to love the shit and bought a ton of this shit over, over time. And, and it's super unethical, you know, harvested super shitty. Like I feel totally bad about it, but I, I, I myself have probably used, you know, at least two of those 50, 50 gallon drums of that shit over my, Oh time. yeah. Oh you yeah. Know? And, uh, so the, when I kind of the first time that I really got on what the how powerful and cool this shit was, it was this time that I was super busted and I bought bought this thing and I threw just a handful of it on top of a five gallon pot onto this cherry pie. And I ended up winning this Terp Festival, this big, big thing against everybody in Washington, all the 502s for my rosin, you know, this and it's I literally just gave it only this uh, seabird guano pellets. Uh-huh. And, and this is my this is my point to your to, to your story is like. I have for, for a long time after that, I, that's all I could, that I could seriously, I could do it right now. I could walk and find any plant that's struggling, throw a small handful of these pellets, powdered poop pellets, and I could bring a plant to full term and make yeah. the best fucking weed you've ever had in your goddamn life with water and pellets. That's, that's very little science to it. This is my, this is my point. Like, you, if you flip this around to, uh, you know, if you want to go synthetic, they have some really cool ass fucking pellets. Oh, I know. And, you know, and I'm, I'm yeah. not, I'm, I don't, I'm not advocating that. I think it's fucking horrible. It destroys the earth. It's not going to taste good. It, there's a bunch of fucking bullshit problems. But my point is like, you know, that if, if you want it to be that fucking stupid simple, it can be like they only made those charts and that nutrient and all that stuff in those A's and B's and ups and downs and all the stuff. Oh, to make yeah. Feel like you were doing something cool, you know, right. when they could have just given you a fucking pellet. Ah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, actually, if you look at the label of any of the grocery store products, you could actually, since they're all 98% water or more or higher, um, you could actually take a bottle like the size of a murine eye drops, and that would be your juice, and it would say, add this to so much per quart, you know, and think of like the carbon footprint deal. Right. Shipping Just, everything. Oh, and the cost, the cost of those containers to lure you into buying, paying big money. They're not cheap. I mean, they're using PVT plastics. And I mean, That's- anyway, you get the idea. It's, you know, anyway, so I, I, my point was, and I wasn't very popular, but hey, you know, a hundred years ago, they had to get rid of the guys that drove uh, horse-drawn carts delivering ice. You know, hey, it must suck, but you know, go get a do something else, get a hamburger next week. You know, uh, working in a grocery store, you know, it's just not going to happen. People buy online. There's a lot of businesses that are going going out, having nothing to do with just we shop different now. You know. Yeah, it happened to the snowboard industry. Uh, oh my gosh! Ago. Yeah, it just destroyed. Yeah, um, you know, lots of industries. We had a, a question from Chat Coot. It goes, uh, "Coot, what about the difference in between basalt and different regions? Uh, Texas, uh, I can't get local basalt, but if it's shit, I won't." <laughs> Or he's in Texas. He can get local basalt, but if it's not any good in Texas, he won't. Well, uh, I don't know Texas law, but if it's labeled basalt, it means it came from a volcano. Um, and it's important. From- like, you might, you might. We're going to just say this, but basalt is like advanced, decomposed rock, right? Like right, to understand yeah, the process, right. granite. Is right. becomes basalt. It that's that's yes. the beauty of it. Is is no, it, it's like uh, super crumbly, super right, fucking decomposed. Right, and and those are the only two sources of rock dust, basalt and uh, granite that are paramagnetic, and so you can do some reading on that. Um, other things I don't understand how they're called rock dust, like zeolite, bentonite, azomite. Um, those are all uh, aluminous silica compounds. I mean, look at you look up the just the zeolite. It's they're clays. Uh, in the case of uh, azomite, 
not that's a brand name from a group in uh what utah i guess or something um but the actual original deposit was discovered in france in the 12th century and they've been making beehive ovens with that material for the last what seven eight hundred years you know but anyway so this the, the uh, deposit in utah they gave it a name a to z minerals and i don't know it stands for something but it's i can't think of the name the way it is uh but again that's just a brand name anthrax there are, a stands for anthrax let's get that straight yeah i don't get it it's not and that Canadian rock, uh, rock dust is glacial rock dust is basically sand. I mean, I don't know. Whatever blows your hair back. But you and I are lucky because we can. People have to be careful though with those those rock dust products and kelp products. You can use them for sure, but if you go crazy with it, you can get into heavy metal issues if you go totally. Bad. I know, and as we talked about before, you're almost always talking about seaweed extract and there's a world of difference between seaweed extract and kelp meal it's not even in the same you know it's just well, uh, well, and because for me because i you know i don't use the smart pots because i grow direct into the ground sure you know i, I have the raised bed above it so i i kind of i play the bo best of both worlds in my head i'm playing the best of both worlds anyways but um, the plants have the, the the microbes have the ability to harness the the that clay, those minerals, the the rock rock you know all that they have they can get it from the natural ground, you know. But I, I will say that um, I ran this system for almost I added a bunch of compost tea the first couple of years and then I ran it for almost two years almost water only, and. I got to the end of the end, of, you know, about about to the end of the two years, and, and I noticed that the, the, the flower, the, the back, I noticed that I was ta I talked about this before when I was mowing the lawn behind the greenhouse and the fan would kick on, that it didn't stink as much. You know, I was like, I used to kind of hang out there for a minute and just like take it in, you know, and really bask in the smell. And I was like, yeah, it smells good, but that's not like, what's going on? Is my nose clogged? Like, I'm not just, this isn't taking me over like it used to. And uh, then I and I kind of went back into the greenhouse and that was my first cue. And then I kind of walked around and thought, you know, I realized that the th things were just weren't smelling as good. And I thought it through and I thought, well, it might be minerals. And so I got uh, at the same time, I got gifted uh, some the Crater Lake Mineral dude sent me some some, you know, it's, it's granite. And yeah. um, so I, I put it on there and sure as shit, bam, next cycle flavor well, still up. And I was like, no shit. All right. OK. You know, if you look for uh, Cascade Minerals, that's the brand name that's coming out of a deposit near Redmond, Oregon, and the long story behind it. But one of the guys that's involved in it spent uh, 42 years with the U.S. Geological Service based right here in the Northwest studying the volcanic action that went on here for millions of years. And I we were talking about the quality of basalt and he said it all comes down to hardness. I know it's counterintuitive, but uh, it's true. He said, so basically Hawaii and the Northwest have some of the best basalt in the world as it relates to horticulture or agriculture. And so, um, gosh, you can get that easy enough. When you, when you say, to hardness do you like because i used to i used to climb mountains and, and spend a lot of time climbing basalt um and vantage and in these different columnar basalt and and, right. and then i then i got to go down to california and climb granite cracks and it was like holy shit you yeah. guys don't know how easy this is this is like fucking pancakes like solid as climb you know what i mean like i'm used to having to pull and shit down because it would literally crumble and you know it would it would it's not like limestone, but it, it would crumble and full mm -hmm. out. And so my question is, is it the, 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 the softer, more crumbly, more decomposed no. that's better? No, or no? the opposite. No, the, the opposite. opposite. How this came about in part was a contract with the uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers. And they're responsible for the waterways and which uh, for trade. 
and national security, which of course the Columbia River qualifies for that. And so they are responsible for having the jetties built that slows down the uh, river so that the uh, ships can navigate from Astoria on up to Columbia. So they did them out of uh, basalt. And while they weren't going to cut them like a dice, you know, a pair of dice or something, they had to be of a certain shape and volume. And then, so there was a lot of pieces and they imported some machines from uh, South Africa uh, used in the diamond trade. And so they turned these smaller chunks of this hard shit into a powder, uh, a, a rock dust. And, okay, concentrates used to sell 250,000 pounds a year of Canadian glacial rock dust from Gaia Green Company. Right. And when the, when the basalt hit, it was like over. Okay, shit. I mean, yeah, basalt yeah. just went, yeah, fuck. Um, so you you shouldn't have any problems finding. And no, I have, one is that, I have it. I've used it. it, it I added it in my original mix. Um, I, I, and probably off of your recommendation, you know, um, I think even the guy that in Portland had me, I, I, he had me adding, Gaia, he had me adding all of it. I, I had Gaia green, I had green sand, I had the salt, I had like four or five different rock dusts. And that was his mm. approach was just like smatter it, you know? Mm. I'm, a, I'm like, uh, what's the word? Minimalist. The only, uh, after I mix the soil, which is uh, a third, 33% of vermicompost, probably at about like 65, 70% uh, worm castings. Uh, that's pretty much, uh, but anyway, I only add, uh, the only amendments is you would define an amendment would be a uh, kelp meal, North Atlantic uh, brown kelp, uh, neem meal, right straight from India, baby. And, uh, oh yeah, and uh, the one that Scotty says will cause microbial collapse, uh, barley. So uh, I'm gonna roll the dice. In spite of his, in spite of he his sage that, advice, why, how could he say that barley would cause microbial collapse? That's literally I, the I, process of making beer, right? Like the latest, microbe, yeah. The latest one is fish emulsion. <laughs> fish emulsion is bad for your plants. Sorry, this is just I wild. Know, did, you know, Maybe I, there, hear, I didn't hear it. There used so. to be something called Three Sisters Growing. The Native Americans did it for thousands of years, where they put a fish underneath the seeds. And then yeah. they put the, anyways. Yeah, I'm not really trying to be on talking shit on him, but like that's uh, yeah. Oh, I will. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't have to. I will. <laughs> I've been, I, I've been dealing with this. Uh, there's an old mafia term, WPF, weasel piss fuck, for five years, and uh, when he showed up, and just got in my face, and I said, "Well, who are you?" You know, and he says, well, I'm a graduate of the Elaine Ingham. And I started just, that was uh, just the beginning. And then, um, so I left uh, social media for two or three years. And I said, fuck you. Over that? And I come, no, just, you know, it's so childish. I mean, it really yeah. is. And, um, you know, it's like, you can't sit at our table. This is for the cool kids, you know, high school kind of shit. You know? Right. Um, but. And then, so when I came back uh, to make, anyway, uh, about a year ago, whatever it was, um, somebody says, oh, yeah, he's got a channel. <laughs> a what? <laughs> a channel. And so he had just started that claim, and then uh, it, it goes on and on and on. Um, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Just, you know, and people like a Peter at, uh, so, future cannabis product. Well, he'll have on because this guy will just make the most outrageous, stupid statements you know possible, and so it's clickbait, you know. And then, uh, and then you get a bunch of minions running around going, "Oh, did you know that that's <clears throat> that neem oil will clog the stomata? Do you know what stomata is?" 
No, but I know that it'll get clogged. Oh, okay, good. All right. They don't get clogged. They use as a director. They use neem oil for lettuce. On on. In fact, the largest organic certified uh, mm. aquaponic facility in the United States, over a hundred thousand square feet, Superior Fresh uses uh, our, organic neem products. And I don't know because someone organic, does. You know, a What's lot of that? the organic, uh, a lot of the large scale organic producers do. You know, because mm. they can get it OMRI certified and it works pretty well. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't, um, I personally try to avoid using neem sprays uh, in, in my stuff, at least for cannabis, uh, for foliar stuff. I have other solutions for most of those problems now, but um, uh, anyways, um, uh, we had a question from well, chat. Uh, goes, uh, Coot, can you mention, uh, you mentioned about alfalfa and limestone uh, to create chitinase. Uh, can you expand on this? Um, no, chitinase, many, many plants produce the enzyme chitinase, okay? Uh, it can also occur in nature when chitin is added to the soil, like, for example, uh, all seashells are calcium carbonate, right? But a handful contain chitin, shrimp, crab, uh, uh, lobster, uh, tad not tadpoles, uh, the ones they eat in the south, the red ones, crawdads, those have chitin in between the layers of shell. And chitin is a polysaccharide, it's an acetyl form of uh, glucosamine. How's that? And so, it, when bacteria attempt to deconstruct it, they create an enzyme called chitinase, and chitinase destroys insect eggshells, for example. Um, and in our bodies, we refer to certain functions as immune systems. In plants, the term used is pathways. And the chitinase hyphen salicylic acid pathway is one of the most powerful pathways in the uh, world of plants. All plants produce some levels of salicylic acid where we anyway we can increase that by using a natural product the gel from aloe vera uh the fronds as they're called the leaves whatever so um salicylic acid is now being considered by many botanists around the world as a plant hormone and it would be a good idea for people who are really serious about plants to at least study salicylic acid as it relates to botany more so than skin care because it's in almost every over-the-counter and, and what do you prescribed. think about can i get interrupt and ask about what do you think about um like some of the the, the dried or powdered forms versus obviously the fresh is going to be better have you ever messed with the powdered forms of aloe oh yeah oh yeah in fact uh, jeremy soba that's one way that he built his company, Build a Soil, was selling. Okay, so in the world of aloe vera, um, the manufacturers offer spray dried and freeze dried. And they offer it in like 100, um, 200. Now, two, uh, 200. What that means is that one gram of the 200 with uh, 200 with 199 grams of water will make pure uh, aloe vera, which equals for this discussion a little bit around seven ounces. So if you're gonna uh, manufacture aloe vera products, you're not gonna ship them around the world liquid. You're gonna turn it into a powder. And the two major ways to do that is uh, spray dried which literally is sprayed against the wall a steel plate or a freeze dried and the freeze dried is going to retain more of the bang bang so for com especially commercial uh which you would definitely qualify for that um you can get a kilo of 200x um aloe vera powder so 
and that's going to for two hundred and fifty dollars, and that's going to make that's a kilo, that's a thousand grams. I figured out it'll make fifty five gallons of pure aloe vera juice, just to give you an idea. And go yeah. try to buy that. Yeah, go try to buy that much liquid. Right. And if you do buy a liquid, it's just been reconstituted. Nobody ships or nobody ships. If you do for laboratory stuff, you got to like plan ahead and order. There's only one region in the United States that it's grown, and that's down on the Mexican Texas border, Rio Grande Valley. That's why uh, one, uh, one of the big man manufacturers, the name of their product or company is Lily of the Desert, because aloe vera is a lily, not a cactus, cacti. So that's where the name comes from. So, yeah, I don't know what it is, but uh, what got a, a bug up uh, Scotty's behind about barley. It must have been in a, maybe went to a Jehovah's Witness meeting or something. Yeah. He yeah. invoked God. The, he invoked God the other day. And it cracked me up. Yeah. So I haven't watched that thing. And, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sorry. Like, to, like, cause I don't like to talk shit about people at all. But oh. some, some things, and, and it, they just, I, you know, and it's not that I don't disagree with people. It's I definitely do. I just like to, I don't know. But, um, yeah. I, I, I like to learn. I, I like to still be able to learn from people even when they're dumb. You know, like I, even dumb people have a lot to teach me. And um, I, I, I don't think Scott's dumb, I, you know, at all. I think he does. He does dig into some things. Um, he also, you know. We all, you know, whatever. I, I should, I'm not going to say anything oh. about him other than I, he, he's, he does some things that are already okay. pretty smart, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to show you that I, I, I'm big enough to. Let's not talk shit about him. No, I <laughs> won't. Something I won't. else. No, I'm going to give you uh, two ideas to pass on to him. Now I don't we talk have. To him. The, I mean, I'm just, I just don't want to. Wait a minute. We, 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 can we got the avocado. We got the avocado. We got the avocado attack. All right. So let's see a mango uh, chutney tech. And let's see. Oh, how about a, a spicy mole tech? And I mean, add a little panache and zip, you know. Um, avocados, eh, you know, kind of expensive. You get cut them open and get through the seed. And, uh, you know, big mess. So my idea is that we can get this to market. Give it a zippy name. Uh, I don't know, put a dog on it, you know, an English bulldog. There you go, product right there. Look what uh, Jeremy did with my idea of gnarly barley. Of course, now we know that it causes microbial collapse, so we want to use that. <laughs> oh, my God. So... So what Are, is the barley? Ever, barley? I don't. I don't know what that product is. Is it just a a, a barley mix, crack crack barley? Yeah, and then he added uh, uh, minerals, uh, uh, hemp seeds. Um, now the word just to explain the word malted, all that means is sprouted. It doesn't mean yeah, but anything sprout, else. Yeah, but sprout at the perfection. Like, that, you got to give these well, fucking malters oh, some, some credit, dude. Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. No, wait a minute. Even big companies like Anheuser-Busch, when they're still owned by the Bush family, their malting was outsourced. That's, you know, when, when barley, first of all, it's all contract growing. You don't just show up at the doors and go, hey, I got, you know whatever, 20 tons of some really good barley, I agree. It doesn't work that way. They want to know the cultivar. It's got to have the ash test, the moisture level. I mean, it's got to be perfect, period. And then the whole malting thing is, you want to talk technical. You guys would really appreciate it in the aquaponics. No, it's super thing. crazy. It's super oh, crazy. Oh, oh, it's insane. Yeah. I, I couldn't do it. Yeah, wouldn't even try. That's 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 like I remember uh, around that, you know, whatever it was, uh, 2014 ish, and, and yeah. people started started uh, doing like malt, trying to like sprout their own stuff, right? They were doing sprouted corn, yeah. 
and sprouted yeah. uh, whatever. Um, For the Zia teams, they wanted the uh, cytokinins from yeah. the Zia team. And it's like, it yeah. works, but you got to be on your shit and you, and to, to begin with. Well, you know, you know, in that regard, I never tried to monetize it. I, all I ever did was on the weed boards. This is pre-social media. I'm not saying social media didn't exist, but it wasn't a force like it is now. But in the old days, the cannabis boards like IC Mag, Grass City, uh, Lollipop Heaven over there, at THC Farmer. And they were just fronts for seed brokers. That's all it was. I mean, shit. IC Mag had seed bay and uh seed boutique right you could you could bid on old genetics you know like cinderella or c9 you know whatever just who knows i don't know i whatever yeah and there's a lot of good bs stories running around the cannabis team i worked i worked on this strain for years no you didn't it was an accidental, you know, a male popped its pollen. He got 500 seeds. I get it. Um, Josh, do you want to tell everybody about the conference coming up and the dates? I put them in the in the chat there, too. I don't know the exact dates, but they uh, we're going to do four, four, four tours, four stops on the tour. Uh, it'll be a the farm. Last... A farm? No. No farms, no. Uh, the, it's just it'll be, it'll be at, at like different places. But um, oh, um, so we have the first one is Jan and last week of January uh, is Humboldt, and it's a, that's in Garberville at the Richardson Grove uh, campground, formerly RV Park, now campground. <laughs> um, and uh, then then the next one's going to be in uh, Michigan this the last weekend of February at the grow greens um mi and there you go you got it up for me make it easy for me and then uh the then we're in maine the last weekend of march the march 26th through 28th and uh and then uh we're gonna be at the in dresden up at uh this fucking dope farm up there they have a beautiful barn they've been hosting events at this family has invited us up there and it's gonna be really cool and then the last one uh, will be in oklahoma I don't know where that's going to be yet. I've got some leads, yeah. um, but I haven't. Uh, I, Steve's got some leads for me. Yeah, um, I talked to them. Brandon Actually, Russ got some leads for me, and so I talked. I talked to them today. Uh, uh, if you uh, those dates are available for for the venue that that we had talked about there, so if we end up nice. doing it there, we'll be able to have a big capacity. Yeah, we so there's a bunch of places, a handful of places there. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not worried about it. I've, I've got to dig into that, um, and. Uh, Tickets are not on sale yet. It's just to save the date. Let everyone know this is happening. Um, I've talked to a handful of speakers that are that are going to be there. God willing, COVID willing, border willing. Um, Steve is 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 down for the cause. Josh and Kelly, Dragonfly Earth Medicine, are down for the cause. Chris Trump is down for the cause. Kevin Jodry is down for the cause. Uh, Suzanne Wainwright Evans. The bug lady is definitely down for the cause and um, as are a bunch of other growers too. So I'm thinking <clears throat> I'd like to open the event on Friday with uh, a, a day, day full of uh, a panel of growers, not a panel, but uh, grower presentations. And um, there, there's a handful of uh, commercial growers and I really do mean a handful of commercial growers that I really, really respect and think are doing cool things, but doing different things. And I'd like them to come and I haven't invited them. So I'm not um, dropping any names, but I think people will be interested potentially. And I'd like to uh, have them come and, and present how they do what they do, why they do it, uh, do some Q and a, and then, then go Saturday, we'll go into um, some, some education on the different aspects of, of, of why that's working. And it, it might just set a good pace. And then Sunday, of course, we'll go into genetics um, like we do. So it's going to be uh, I'm really, really, really excited to get back together with everybody. Like it's, it's, uh, it's become an event that, um, 
that really gathers is a gathering and a, and a connection point for a lot of local like-minded farmers. And, um, um, it's also been a good genetic swap for a lot of people too, um, to come and connect on those levels. And so, um, yeah, really excited to, to get back to it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking personally for myself, uh, there's a, ch I'm trying to talk to my family and work it out to, to buy a bus and maybe convert a little bus and do a little, uh, fucking all the way around. That's why the, they're ordered that way. I think that I can go up and hit it and then swing back around, you know? So. You can be like a modern day Ken Casey. <laughs> I'm just trying to have some fun. That's it. No, I, I was, <laughs> you know, you got to bring some humor to this thing because I, I've only been to a couple here in Portland uh, weed events. One yeah. was this, God, was it horrible. So, uh, so all, they're all shitty. I've never been to them. Oh, um, they're, they're bullshit. Yeah, but, I, the, uh, way, the way I do it, it's just like, yeah. it's just like we are here. Like, sorry, not to cut you off. No. Nah. Um, it's, it's just very basic, and I, I'm really bad at inter, introductions. I'm really bad at hyping shit up in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. I misspeak, and I, I say the wrong words, and I cuss too much, and I am often too high. Um, and it just is, in my opinion, it's just the right amount of organization that allows it to work out and be cool and, and not be fucking hypey. Um, yeah. You know, I'd like you to, like you to come, man. Um, we can talk about that later, though. I, you know, the ones that, that I were, okay, so I went to one called Endo Expo, and I, I didn't even know what dreary meant, uh, uh, dismal, okay, and then uh, the one that was homegrown here, uh, that they, well, there's a lot of argument, but anyway, uh, Cultivation Classic, what was classic is that they repeated it you know the next year but anyway um oh so, uh you know decom uh decom and mlk where that that cool pizza shop is and there oh yeah yeah right 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 and there and there's well, that build building that used to have the sex club above it yeah right and that's where yeah. i did the first conference the very first conference yeah. was up there yeah i used to live okay. six block the two three blocks the other way and okay. uh and i found your skateboard available yeah, you were yeah. a skateboarder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, so I got one for you. Now, this is really a way completely unassociated with the cannabis scene. But around the world, there's three major horticulture shows. One's in Frankfurt, one's in Tokyo, and I know it's going to be hard to believe. There's one here in Portland. Uh, and the name of the one in Portland is called the Far West Show. And it's put on by the OAN, which is the Oregon Association of Nurseries. Pretty big. Uh, you know, it's a two billion dollar a year industry here, or was. Um, so this isn't your home and garden show. You're not going to go there and see, you know, massage tables and sauna. You know, fucking fiberglass saunas with chicks with big breasts. You know, this is like for hardcore producers. Uh, and so for a person like yourself, even if you weren't in a position to buy some of this equipment, you could look at it and go, wait a minute. Yeah, I could figure that out. Um, so for that, and if for no other reason, um, and you could look into growing some things that have really good high commercial value, like uh, bamboo, since you have a lot of water, uh, bamboo being a grass, its growth rate is off the chart. If you yeah. grow like some, some of the black varieties, those are used for construction in Japan. They're really extremely hard. The, the, uh, and it's black. It's really cool. So, but anyway, uh, that show is called far West, all one word. You can look it up online and find out yeah. the, uh, you know, if you, if you decide to go, I'll, I'll come down and pull out my old, uh, membership badge. Em Emeritus from the OAN. I was in around what was called the, Oregon Association of Nurserymen. And that's what it had been called for like the first 115 years, right? And then they elected a, a woman nursery owner as the president. And they scrambled and changed it to Oregon Association of Nurseries. So, 
Yeah, they have a magazine and everything. Uh, you know, you could really do well by having an article written about your work because you're local. You're in Northwest. You know how it is. North, everybody yeah. loves the Northwest thing. And uh, that's, I, I don't mean this in a, uh, be a smartest, but that's a good hook. Yeah, for yeah. an article like their publication, since you are here, you're not, you know, in the Midwest or the East Coast or something. So, no, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I, I always try to connect with, with the local, local stuff. And the, the, the company that I actually am kind of modeling myself after in, in some sort of loose way or just like maybe inspired by is this, this seed company called Uprising Seeds up here they're up here in bellingham and they, they oh they, yeah 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 they just do strictly open pollinated seeds yeah that's their that's their 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 catch and they 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 contract out to a, a few of their friends nothing too crazy and i've i've bought most of my vegetable seeds from them like i you know i did like yeah, I, they're I did good. gardening for a minute i, I would spend a thousand dollars a year easy with them for years yeah um and uh, so I just just kind of like really want to model my business after the old school seed banks, too, in terms of cannabis, where, you know, there was a lot of weird sh shady shit or whatever that happened. But but they would have a, a, a plethora of genetics and it wasn't just like yeah. right now everyone is, well, forced, to, is, is forced. You to can show one stuff and, and, yeah. and versus just saying like, hey, this is this is the the uh, the Mazar that I got that I selected in my region and I made yeah. a couple of generations and, and, it, it, you know, I'm going to sell some, some Missouri seeds. And, you know, so I, I want to like build up the stock and build up this, you know, things that are all based out of my climate zone, but that are, are, are classic stuff and, and stuff that I've made and, and just, to, you know, just be, uh, because when I, when I go to vegetable seeds, they all have, they all have, <clears throat> they all have purple Cherokee tomatoes. They all have sure. green for tomatoes, but you know, I choose to buy my green zebra tomatoes from uprising because theirs are open pollinated in, in right. Bellingham, Washington, you know, I'll tell you what another I, seed. How did, that your, you should... how did your Zamal end up? I meant to ask you that, you know, um, I only ended up with the one seed, um, because I, I smashed all my other seeds and I ran it for a couple of years and, it just, uh, I actually just ended up letting it go. It wasn't, wasn't, I, I kept it around for a couple of years, just wanting it to be something and thinking that maybe I wasn't growing it proper. And then I just finally had to let her go. So. Uh, please write this down because if you don't know about them, you're going to want to. Their former name for years was Horizon Herbs down in uh, Williams, Oregon, Southern Oregon. And then he reorganized the company. They grow their own seeds. So you're going to like that part of it. Now it's called Strictly Medicinal Seeds. And I've been doing business with him for, I don't know, 20 years or more. He was a gentleman who traveled the world as a young man and met with shamans and teachers and holy men. And he has one of the widest collection of medicinal plants in North America. And he's like the main guy, if you want uh Bocking 14 comfrey starts, uh, root starts. Um, he's with the other I have, guy. I have it already on the property here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, but it, uh, stuff that man will blow your mind. Uh, He's got a pack for thirty dollars, and it's nineteen or eighteen varieties, different plants, from uh, burdock and don't laugh dandelions that grow like thirty inches in diameter. For salads and yeah, yeah. such, uh, yeah, it's, he's they're legit, man. They're I, the I, real I, deal. I it down. Cool. Yeah, for sure. They uh, just wonderful people to. Uh, to do business with i mean they're really high integrity and they you know they're not not part of the cannabis scene but uh somebody was talking about water issues man down on the california oregon border that's a big uh, you mentioned pears 
Well, yeah, that's like one of the biggest pear producing regions in the 11 Western states. Uh. I, I mean, hundreds, uh, thousands of acres of Camas and Anjou and Bartlett's, you know, the different times of the year, they, uh, and pears are weird. Like this pear is only available for these four months, you know, so that's why they're always changing at the market. Bosk, you know, for example, that's more of a winter pair, that kind of thing. But yeah, huge uses of water. Then you also have sport fishing, the Rogue River. You know, you can't shut down those jet boats. <laughs> it make a lot of money, you know, Gold Beach, go there and, you know, rent one of those crazy ass boats that you have no business, you know, being in as far as horsepower. And you had what, an hour now, and, you know, as far as navigating any kind of a boat. Okay, she would work out well. Don't forget the beer. They've had a few beers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a few beers over at the, the Hoopy Inn, you know, there in uh, Gold Beach. So, my question is yeah. like, look at the tax revenue difference. So, like, let's just go back to like we were saying with the almond tree. Like, an almond tree is six to eight hundred cannabis plants. The tax revenue from the almonds from that one tree certainly as hell isn't as good as the tax revenue from that cannabis. So how essential is it, non-essential is it really? Because all of a sudden that city and the state's gonna suddenly have its whole tax base evaporate. And that's been one of the few insulated tax bases during COVID. Well, you get down to, okay, there's a term in German and it's spelled with a K, not a C, real politic, okay? And here's, an unfortunate reality. The almond industry is well represented at state, federal, and probably county levels in areas of production. I know that there's the Oregon Pear Association, for example. Um, I would suspect that there's the Oregon jet boat owners of the Rogue Valley, you know, or something of that line, and they give political contributions. And I guess what's going to happen is nothing. Because that's what we do in this country, nothing. We'll have a committee and somebody will throw up some ads and you have to decipher who's the good guy or not, you know. And uh, yeah, we just left with a mess. The, the problem is there's not enough water to do all the things that are required for the existing agriculture endeavors. Certainly, we're not even talking legal grows. Uh, I sent Puma article from the Oregon Public uh, Broadcasting about the uh, cartel grows in Southern Oregon, unregistered, 80 acres, 2,000 plants an acre. I mean, do the arithmetic. That's 160,000 plants. And what you were talking about, what happened in, in Washington, the way they screwed over the medical growers. I mean, it was brutal. Just literally really, took everything everything away from we, them. We had, uh, the, you know, their, their estimates, when they when they estimate stuff, they're always low. Unless unless it's unless it's a bust, then it's high. Yeah, yeah right. They, right. they, they, said, they said that, that uh, there was 2,000 some stores uh, retail outlets, medical retail outlets in the state. And this is in 2014, mid 2014, 2015. I think they finally shut medical down in 2016. And um, dude, I was here. I mean, I was selling, I, had, I sold to 18 stores. I had a, uh, a 50 light, uh, you know, warehouse and I had a handful of folks that worked for me and I would drive around every week and, and hit up these, these, these 18 stores. It was fucking, I didn't, I didn't take, it was a beautiful thing. I don't know. They really fucked up because in my mind, what it did is it, it was brought back to our, our, our state. What made America great in my mind was farming. Yeah, you know, and, and we did a lot of fucked up things along the way. I'm not ju going to justify any of those things. Like, I, 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 this is my reductionist view of it, but like, 
farming made America great in that every family could like literally they moved west and found a place of land they could grow, hunt, kill, harvest, cultivate their food and their livelihood. And then the, and, and that's what made us great is we all had that. We all had the, our, we were all self, self-sustaining and that gave us the ability to be industrious. And, and, and out of that, that eventually turned into this capitalistic fucking pig that we are now, you know. Um, One of the greatest, uh, so, uh, excuse me, soil biologists I ever had the opportunity to talk to is Dr. Frost, the founder of BioAg. Yeah. Uh, human he'll, he'll, acids. Be the, he'll be at the uh, aquaponic conference in November. He's going to be one of the speakers. Awesome. He, he told me verbatim, I had an opportunity at uh, this horrible weed show. He had a booth and I was working a booth for somebody. God, that was the last one. Um, but we were talking about the Willamette Valley per se, because that's where he was domiciled his business down near uh, Salem, south of Salem. He said that because of the volcanic activity that the soils from the Canadian border down to about mm, Redding, Red Bluff in Northern California, some of the richest in the world and directly related it to the basalt levels. Because, you know, the entire earth is covered with basalt. You go down deep enough, the entire ocean is a layer of basalt. you know, there's parts in, in Washington and Oregon, especially east, uh, eastern sides of the state, where you go down several hundred feet and all of a sudden you hit basalt that's a mile thick. You know, it's just, it's, my home is built on a basalt ledge. They couldn't even, the, the neighborhood was established back in 1840. And on this particular lot, um, they couldn't build on it till 1994 to have the technology what it took to put in the pilings so they could put because it's on a hill you know so they had to like engineer this silly thing and plus the owner was the uh, president of the iron workers local so you know I'm sure there was some decisions made that would uh, you know help out his uh, buddies in the union so being a good union man So have you, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. So have you ever personally used barley in your soil? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've talked about this before. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I got a, I got a, um, a, a grinder. Um, You're not worried right. about microbial collapse or? No, I yeah. see it. The, the fungi love it. Obviously. It's I know. obvious that the fungi love it, so. Here's what pisses at. Here's what pisses off the people, like uh, uh, just people. They can't handle it that something that costs eighty cents a pound is blowing away their bullshit. That's three and four, or five hundred dollars a gallon. I mean, kiss my ass. Right. I know how to read a label. You know, I'm not a chemist, but I don't have to be. You know, I know what 98.4 water inert ingredient means. You know, I don't have to Google that. Jesus Christ. That was a gift to the uh, fertilizer industry. They used to require that they use the word water. And then through our coin operated Congress, they now can use inert ingredient. What does that mean? What oh, water. Yeah. So this is the uh, the second annual virtual aquaponic cannabis conference we'll be holding in November 13th and 14th. Um, if we end up, uh, we're trying to fill a third day. We might also do the 12th. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we do have 13th and 14th completely booked up now, though. Um, so we'll start announcing speakers here in a little bit. But Coot's going to be a speaker there. Josh is going to be a speaker. We have uh, speakers from the only uh, legal aquaponic cannabis facility in Bangladesh. We have a gentleman speaking to us from South Africa who has both a large soil and aquaponic cannabis uh, legal facility there in South Africa. 
we have uh, Dr. Faust, we have Dragonfly, we have um, uh, Joe Pate, we have uh, Chris Trump, we have uh, a whole bunch of cool people, uh, and even some cool surprise people that I think you guys haven't heard of. Um, there's a gentleman who does um, a KNF that's kind of doesn't do anything in the cannabis world, but has some really cool different ideas, and he's going to come talk to us, so that'll be cool. Uh, and just a couple of other surprise people that I think you guys are going to be a bit surprised came out of the woodwork uh, to come talk at this. So it'll be really, really neat. And, and I'm excited uh, about that here in November. So uh, save that weekend. Uh, it'll be free again, just like last year and live online. Uh, and then we'll repost those all as recorded uh, format, uh, you know, in the weeks after, just like we did last time. So, yeah. Love to put together uh, these big educational events. Last year was a huge success. We had just a, an immense amount of cool knowledge get shared last year and helped a lot of people kind of get started in their aquaponic cannabis journey. And we kind of want to build on that momentum from last year. So super stoked to put that together again. And I'll be moving here next month and we'll be into a much better space. We'll have space for my own garden again and, and all that stuff. So it'll be good because I've been traveling quite a bit and then we've been looking for a place for quite a while. So it'll be nice to have a uh, home base again. So you mean as in get out of Oklahoma? Oh, no, I'm still in Oklahoma. I'll just be in a oh, okay. place okay. in Oklahoma. <laughs> okay. But yeah, yeah, I have some I other projects outside of the U.S. that uh, this yeah, I know. I just... relax a little bit. Uh, I'm going to be zipping around quite quickly. I, I just find it ironic that for most of my life, that was the kind of place you avoided if you were in the uh, cannabis trade, you know? Oh, yeah. I remember, like, you don't laugh, but we'd go to Detroit to pick up the uh, product. And then we'd drive it to the West Coast, you know, pick up a truck with a shell thing. And, oh, yeah, one of their dogs from Germany, Rudolph and Heinz and meanest motherfuckers ever been around uh they're professionally trained guard dogs you know and then we get it drop it off at a car shop in north hollywood who was part of the, their group and then they would take the truck apart and remove all the cannabis and then we get a call and we go pick up so anyway we, we were given like 30 days you know, you get their money to them. So that was the, the immediate goal was to get it moving. So fun times. Yeah, driving through Nebraska at two in the morning. You know, if I get pulled over, I'm going to be in prison for like the next 30 years, at least, right? It's not as exciting as it used to be, you know? You used to be able to like lose weight on the drive just from the heart rate, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, was it Nevada? The guy had two and a, two and a half ounces. Two and a half fucking ounces. And they gave him 15 years. This was like 76, 77. This is brutal. I mean, get pulled over in L.A. and have two seeds in their floorboard. And you, you know, look like you were a smart ass, you know. Yeah, you were going to go in front of a judge, at least get probation, you know, just dick you around court visits and the attorney fees, you know, the drill. Just run you through the mill. Shake you, shake you down for as much cash as they can. So have just said it's coriander. So, man, I'm a baker. I get baked as a baker. The night that... Uh, Cannabis was going to go decriminalized on January 1 this year. Okay. So before midnight, it was technically still illegal. So you got a picture of the scene it's down the old part of Huntington Beach. You know, it's apartment buildings and old cottages, you know, beach shacks and stuff. It was just surfers, you know, and Young people, 
So we were having a party. Of course, it's fucking New Year's Eve, man. And so some neighbors called. And, well, first they came over very politely and asked if we could turn it down. And somebody there had to be a smart ass and tell them to go pound sand. So they, in turn, called the uh, local police department who came and we were very polite and said, you know, hey, you got to turn your music down. So we did. And then later in the night, he got back up. You know, it works. And so the police come back and now they're pissed because they got a really busy night and they're dicking around with a bunch of, you know, punks. And somebody goes into the bathroom and shakes the baggie that has a little bit of weed in it. And so it's swirling around the toilet and the cop busts through the door and he grabs a towel. And he wipes the side inside of the uh, toilet. And so anyway, they're charged with 0.7 grams of cannabis. And uh, yeah, I had to go in front of a judge and you know, just get dicked around and pay some stupid fine and you know, go pick up, you know, paper along the uh, freeway, you know. Teach your lessons, man. Can you imagine that cop telling the story to his his fucking children? Oh yeah, Charlie. You got. I got to tell you, like, I I was I was in the thick of it. The the drugs were flying around, and I I had to dive into a fucking toilet with a towel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, what a dip. If you ever get a chance to read any of the books about uh, Orange Sunshine in that era in Laguna Beach when the Brotherhood was you know, distributing Orange Sunshine all around the world, uh, using Jolly Green Giant corn cans. They had a canning machine. They could make their own cans. They had the labels. One of the guys, associate, an uncle, a grand, whatever, some relative owned a print shop. And boy, we got a deal for you. So they printed up exact copies of the G, uh, Jolly Green Giant corn can thing. And so they were shipping these around the world. Uh yeah, I mean, you can go to Goa, India, and buy Orange Sunshine from Laguna Beach, you know, for five dollars a hit. So uh, it was widely distributed. You know, Paris and England, and there were just a lot of people eating Orange Sunshine. Well, shit, guys, um, I'm getting to the end of my night. I gotta yeah, but flip on those tarps, take those tarps off in the morning. Sounds good. Do you have uh, how do people find you and how do they find out more about the conferences? And else? Um, on Instagram, I'm Dutch Blooms. I am um, a few handles: regenerative cannabis, um, regenerative seeds. Um, the, the easiest way to reach me is, uh, on the, on the new website, regenerateseeds.com. Um, and, uh, you can link to kind of everything from there. So yeah, there's also the, 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 the conference site, which is regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. Um, that you can also link to everything through. So yeah, dudes, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, to talk to you all um got me out a little while to drink some beers and did it all live so it's a fun show um it's a pleasure coot talking to you sir um like to continue the conversation yeah i just wanted to say it's really i enjoyed talking with you you're doing some really exciting uh exciting things and uh there a lot of what uh, mr trump had to say is a way over my head um, you know, uh, terms and initials and things like that can be uh, 
daunting for uh, someone who's not familiar with. Uh, I mean, I think I can, I, you know, I can handle myself in a, a general discussion of microbiology, but I'm not, you know, right. I'm not, you know. It gets really I'm confusing. Not, I, it's it's basically, a, 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 to break it down, it's basically a, a, the IMO is a biological inoculant to the soil, and then okay. they make foliar nutrient feeds to balance to balance the nutrients through the plant's, plant's life through fermenting plants sure that's essentially it yeah so. yeah yeah um yeah I, I i got involved when the rage you know we it was uh em1 and right. i guess it's now called terragonics or something and then there was the counterfeit one and it went to court and you know blah 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 um so then things kind of settled down and then KNF began uh, being discussed as opposed to EM1. That was about the time, you know, when I, I don't know, it wasn't, I didn't like it. It just, I don't know, I didn't do it. So it seemed like there were a lot of rules, you know, like Tim Wilson and no, you got to cook it at this temperature. And oh, Jesus Christ, man, it's fucking lack of what are we talking here? How hard can it be? And uh, anyway, and I think I made some bakashi that I took way too low. I mean, it really did a number. I think I was down like around two or something. It was really. I've never messed low. with bakashi at all. Yeah. Um, but I think ultimately the devil's in the details and all this stuff, you know, you get like, if you want to, you know, right. And, and it's, it's what you're up for, you know, as a gardener, what, what do you, what do you want to play around? What do you want to spend your time doing? Right. You know, do you want to spend, spend your time making nutrients? Do you want to spend your time plucking leaves? Do you want to spend your time transplanting plants? Do you want to spend your time smelling weed? Yeah. I want to spend my time smelling weed. That sounds good. Sign me up. Sign me up for that last part. I want to do that. Yeah. That's my jam. Fucking smell some weed and work hard in the morning, you know, and smell some weed. Can we smoke anyway. it too? Do we have to just smell it? Like oh, it. yeah. You can smoke it. Oh, you can smoke it. Yeah. And I'll smell some more and smoke some. I mean, I have to be honest. I'm going to kind of just do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on rip, repeat. A little bit. All right, All right guys. Let's go right there. Like that should be the, the must drop right yeah. there. <laughs> All right. All right, brother. Have a good evening. You guys good too. Evening. Peace out. Peace. That was fun. Yeah, Josh has got a really cool farm. Uh, he was one of the speakers at last year's uh, virtual aquaponic cannabis conference. You should check that out for sure. I didn't get a chance to say, uh, speaking of beer, man, we have a uh, beer night on Saturday. Dang it. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you may tell everybody about your shows, you have uh, your own uh, a plethora of shows. You do way more than I do per week. It's true. We do like, it seems like infinite shows, like way too many shows. Um, maybe just because they yeah. go on for so long. I don't know. But uh, these guys come on. Coop comes on. Potent comes on. A lot of people in the chat come by. Uh, we, Saturdays is uh, Brews with Buds, but it's basically this show, Chronic Table. Tuesdays, it's uh, a little more formal. You usually kind of have a guest. Uh, uh, sort of, we try to formally learn something. Uh, uh, Saturdays, we kind of kick back a little bit. And we try to focus on, I guess, if you look at the camera, we focus on uh, beers and brewed, brewed craft beverages, stuff like that. Every once in a while, we have a weed and whiskey Wednesday, too, which, as you can imagine, is weed and whiskey. But uh, you know, we like to talk about on Saturdays, uh, uh, beers and brews and buds, and it can be tea and coffee and whatever else it doesn't have to be beer. Uh, some of the people that come on the show, Ozzy, for example, he just drinks water. But, uh, you know, we like to get to, to the nuts and bolts of cannabis, but uh, not take it too seriously. You know, it's more of a kind of a conversational hangout with friends. And uh, it just so happens a lot of the friends know a ton about, you know, food and drink and cannabis and basically everything else in life. All that stuff actually kind of uh, plays together. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times one friend knows the answer to another friend's question and everything else. So anyway, we kind of 
bullshit about that on my channel, Fumidor and the Flavors. You guys are welcome to hang, come hang out. Anyway. The show last week with uh, Chris Trump was excellent. He was Thank given a, uh, the opportunity to explain uh, well, questions from the chat room and or what have you, and uh, really did a good job of, uh, I think, showing people that, you know, take the leap or there's nothing, the water's fine kind of thing. Hmm. So, yeah, I, that was really good. Cheers. We'll have to get you guys back on the uh, show again together. Yeah, I, I learned a lot. I mean, there's, you know, I, I've been so focused for several, well, almost 15 years now with worm castings. Because I think if it works, why change it? You know, I mean, come on. Uh, I lost my interest in finding something new and exciting a long time ago. So I like the idea that it's just a rope. You know, I don't have to think. You know, mix parts A, B, and C, and <laughs> apply water. Yeah. I, I had one of my best questions ever was on IC Mag, and this person said, "I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. What's your watering schedule?" I said, "Well, generally, when the plants need water, I apply it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean, you don't, you know. Then we get into like, you know, whatever, some convoluted thing about." Uh, whatever. Oh, good. Another electronic toy that won't work. I, yeah. Sign me up. And now you're going to get them all on your cell phone, right? That should work out well. I saved money because I got the cheapest phone I could get. And now I'm going to install the best software possible, right? I'm going to monitor a garden. Yeah. Okay. Is there an you insurance actually, policy on me? You're going to give me flashbacks. You can actually, the actually, possible. Marty, Marty, are you still there? Marty actually is like the guru on uh, on budget room control, but he, he has his whole thing tricked up for, um, hopefully he'll come back if not, you know, whatever, whatever. But he, uh, he has his whole thing rigged up with a uh, Amazon weather station. Um, so that he can uh, control everything that way because it has a humidistat, it has a temperature, and it can turn things off and on. Uh, so, and you can put multiple probes of different zones. So you can right. set temperature probes around the room, and then you can actually have that turn humidifiers or dehumidifiers or temperature controllers or fans or lights or whatever off and on. Um, uh, or even pumps and things, you, you can set them to custom things. Yeah. Um, they, you can have them also read on voltage too. It's one of the things that I always like to put on pumps, especially for larger facilities, uh, putting voltage, uh, automatic voltage reporters uh, on the plugs or you know somewhere in line with them so that I know what the voltage draws in it because then I can tell if something's going wrong with that pump before it actually burns out. Um, you know, yeah, we always keep an extra pump on hand for redundancy when possible, but um, you know, I can know ahead of time that the thing needs to be maintenance or replaced or, you know, at least taken offline and swapped out while we repair whatever is wrong with it, you know, before it actually, uh, you know, fully fails on us. Um, so this is some of the stuff that we do, especially on bigger aquaponic systems where we can't really afford stuff to go offline. Right. Are, are you familiar? I, I know you have uh, Alita air pumps. They run about four. A is A L I T A. It's an American. Uh, there was a, there was a, oh, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, Atlantic. Atlantic has a big distribution. They used to be them and, um, uh, okay. Of others, when I used to do, I used to run once upon a time, and everyone's going to laugh at the name of this. I used to run uh, a grow house uh, place called Toby's Treasure Barn, which was the <laughs> supply house for, uh, Blood Good Landscape, which was the oldest uh, uh, landscaping company in the United States. They were founded in like the 1700s or something like that, but super, super cool uh, family. Uh, the whole family are all like, you know, catalogs of knowledge when it comes to any kind of plant and, and you know, different types of organic and non-organic ways to deal with pretty much any disease. Uh, I know certainly uh, Paul Sr. taught me a hell of a lot about how to deal with plants and how to not panic when you have a room full of problems and how to stabilize things without, you know, having to <laughs> But he really taught me a lot about how to, you know, do larger scale. Uh, him and Paul, 
Um, a junior taught me both a lot about uh, plant care and, and all that stuff. So shout out to them if they're listening. But um, uh, I, I think senior passed on at this point. I'm certain he was up there in age uh, when I was there. But um, anyways, uh, where's it going with that? About plant care, large scale plant care. Where are we going with that? Sorry. Hi. I'm making stupid jokes in the chat. Oh, just just about um, uh, how to deal with uh, kind of wacky or crazier stuff that, you know, that a lot of times, sometimes there is kind of a weird organic solution that like there isn't a bottle that you can go buy. And that was something that kind of was like a concept where like, you know, I had learned a lot of organic stuff, but I was always taught, you know, in an emergency, you can run and buy, a, you know, whatever. And, you know, they've kind of figured most things out. Well, it turns out a lot of times that isn't the case, you know, and that really yeah. kind of helped me turn that back around and understand that more. And, and kind of also understand, you know, large scale fertigation and, and large scale pest control and all that stuff. There was somewhere, somewhere I was going with that point wise and I totally lost it. Oh, like, man, like we get stoned, we just kind of lose track of thought. We're just like, what are we talking about? Maybe someone in can chat can help me. Right. No, I don't know. There's like a 15 second delay though, so like if they give you the answer, we have to. Oh wait. yeah, I always forget the chat's quite a bit behind, and the longer the episode, the more it gets. That's Seems right, because like... it buffers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it'll hiccup a little bit, but um, oh, we were talking about automated controllers. Uh, so um, you know, uh, that was one of the places too where we had the voltage stuff all set up across everything and. That was really nice because I could tell when the pump, when the filters on the pumps even were starting to get dirty, and I could go. Sure. Out. We had all these different display ponds and all this other stuff, and it just helped me manage. You know, one person could easily manage like a fuck ton of stuff uh, remotely and just know what's going on in the health of the pumps. You know, without having to really fuck with anything, or even you know take a cover off of anything. You got to take the cover off to look inside. This. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say. Um, what uh? Window. Have you guys had any other? We had um, someone else in chat, and he's gonna laugh because I'm. Sh if he listened, he asked me in the beginning of the episode, so I'm gonna answer his question. Um, but uh, if he's still listening, <laughs> poor guy. Um, he asked about Super Labs recipe. So Super Labs recipe, we did four gallons of milk, uh, and then fresh kefir greens. Uh, and then if you want to add an air collected uh, rice wash labs uh, as a traditional labs collection, uh, you can go ahead and do that. You don't have to. Um, and then uh, add uh, four cups of spirulina. Uh, you can go even heavier than that, but minimum four cups. And then uh, one cup of kelp per four cups of spirulina. Um, you could also go eight cups of, of spirulina and, and two cups of kelp if you want to kind of make it more concentrated. But that's what we use to make the, um, the super labs uh, and that does it'll make a really fine you'll see it'll split out you'll have your curds at, on the top uh, and then you'll have kind of a I don't know a, a, a few inch deep layer of your super labs that stuff is amazing both as a foliar spray and as a, a, a water in uh, solution and then the stuff below that is just your normal labs and you can use that as you would normal labs and then take the cheese, feed that to your fish if you got an aquaponic system, or feed it to your goats or your chickens or your dog or whatever, uh, or turn it into cheese if you want to make it into cheese. Uh, and then uh, and away you go. So hopefully that helps you. It does take you know 10 to 14 days to, for it to separate. So unlike labs, which is like a two-day process, this is a much longer process. Um, so definitely consider that. So like, don't get discouraged. A lot of people will do it for like five or six days and they'll be like, what's wrong? And it's like, yeah, no, you're halfway there though. Like, don't panic. It's fine. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a common thing that I see with people when they're, they're making super labs. Um, it, it does take a longer time for it to, the labs to start isolating that stuff and separating it out. Um, and it'll keep it stabilized in there as long as you don't open it and screw with it. Space alien shit with the blue. Yeah, the neon blue. In fact, I can pull up a picture too. It's good stuff, man. It's it, it, It's very good for repairing fucked up plants and stuff like that. 
Hold on, let me find some pictures. Let me find some all kinds of crazy stuff about it. Like you can basically spray like plants that were dried up and dead pretty much. Like you went on vacation for like a week and oh, yeah. you water them, you come back, like, oh Lazarus, they come back. Yeah, this is, this is what we're talking about. Right. It's good stuff. It's kind of a an advanced uh, lactobacillus isolation, but this is the kind of stuff I think needs a lot more research, right? Like, this is just one weird recipe that I happened to stumble upon when we accidentally spilled too much spirulina or a bunch of spirulina into labs that we were making. And then uh, I started experimenting with other things in it and we realized the kelp accelerated uptake. So that's how we came to this recipe or I came to the res this recipe. So, um, you know, and those ratios, you know, so could they be improved upon potentially? Sure, I don't know. You know, that's just what I found worked well and it might, it'll, it'll work well for you, um, but you could probably refine it further, you know, chemically speaking. Um, uh, hold on, I got another picture. Uh, here we go. This is what it'll look like before you start taking the cheese off. Mm. Nice. But you can't, you you know that, I mean, that color is so vibrant and so distinct. Right. Um, right. You can also take it, if you're into dye making and you want to dye your own wool and stuff, you can actually use this as a blue dye right. as well. I, ju I just got a uh, ebook from uh, the local library system and it was on, uh, obviously this was on a bestsellers list, but it was making uh, different dyes using uh for mushroom growers uh for you know uh yarn for for uh fiber arts and things like that so yeah i think that's really neat uh that people are really re they're keeping those old uh methods alive uh it's a lot of work when you think about it trying to come up with 10 colors on say a shawl, you know, that you want to make for somebody or an Afghan type for the living room. It's a lot of work. Oh yeah. I really well, admire people that make things with their hands mm -hmm. that bring people joy for many years and many memories that that piece will be with their grandchildren, you know. It'll be part of who they are in their in their families. Yep, yep, yep. What uh, how how's your stuff been going with the farm you've been working on, or what have you been up to the last week there, too? Good, good. Week? Just uh, they're lucky in this sense. They have uh, artesian uh, spring, so right now it's providing more water than it could uh, provide more water than they need, but they're only, you know, they're very aware. Um, they got, they were close by a mile and a quarter from the fires that devastated what three or four cities. I mean, very small cities, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't, uh, still they were, there were homes, people, and their lives are just completely uh, evaporated. And uh, it's a tough life, you know, welcome to agriculture. Actually, and, there was uh, a building tonight that just evaporated, basically. Where was it? Uh, like Phoenix? Second. No, um, a building collapse. Where? It just happened. Just oh, Miami. Miami. A Miami. Miami. Right? An entire yeah. building that happened. 100 people, over 100 people are missing. A hundred, which is a nice hey. way of saying that they got killed. I think what America really wants to know is that building collapsed right at the same time that John McAfee died. Coincidence? <laughs> yeah. Is there poo involved? I don't know. You know, when he sold that company to Intel, which put him in, you know, pretty good financial. Uh, position obviously is he was a very strange tech president and then like it was a sigh of relief when he sold it and it was in the hands of adults over at intel 
in Beaverton or where we want to call it. And then he just disappeared, traveled around the world and was living in different places. And you know, it's inter not interesting, but sad in this sense, when he was 15, his father committed suicide. And that was like around 1960, I guess, 61. And so here we are, the family, 60 years later, you know, this gentleman takes his life. So. To be fair, though, so, he, his father didn't have the whole hammock thing going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, look at, <laughs> right, look at Hemings, yeah. Hemingsway fam Hemingway's family history of, of suicide and depression and pretty fucked up. So um, do you have uh, uh, any other um, uh, things going on that uh, you want to talk about? What about you, Fumi? Do you have anything going on in your garden? How's your garden? <clears throat> garden it's actually, actually, it's doing well. And I, uh, I wasn't familiar. I kind of stumbled on with this brand. Uh, affinity and it's plug and play exhaust systems you know they all fit together it's pretty cool and uh, you don't have to run around getting this filter and this this and that blower and what have you it's uh all goes bam 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 and it's actually designed for another industry originally so they're very very quiet by comparison and uh yeah, and the 10 is uh, Gorilla, I think is the name, brand name. Um, it's perfect. I mean, it, you know, standard four by four. And uh, you don't have to run big lights to create heat problems. And I'm not above like deciding, hey, it's not fun anymore. I can come back and play another day and just take it down. You know, I, I have no issues about, oh, this, type, this cycle didn't make it, you know, just cut it down, and turn the lights off. And this may be one of those years I'm kind of concerned about the heat, yeah. which means the humidity levels are, as one person who I knew on a personal level, and he owned or managed uh, grow stores said that this is the time of the year he made money when Oregon's uh, heat hit above uh, around 100 degrees the mites and uh, powdery mildew just well Hume can tell you I, mean, I don't have to deal with them too much thankfully but uh, we've heard about everything from well I say that and I've actually been dealing with spider mites but thankfully that was hopefully a one time thing you know knock on wood um, sure we'll Dude, I, can't, I honestly can't believe it with 111 degrees this weekend. Like, that's so surreal. It's going to be 106, I think, on Saturday, 111 on Sunday, then also like 105 on Monday. Like that's I've never heard of that. In, 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 I've been in Oregon for a long time. We've been here longer. Well, maybe not longer than I have, but I, I don't know. I've never seen that. I think the hottest. I've been here. Six. I've been here 33 years. I do. And the hottest. It was probably around like 10 years ago, nine years ago. And it hit 108. And that was the third week of August. By the way, that's not frost on those leaves. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fuck, man. Jeez. That's when you start pulling out the really heavy duty stuff like uh, oh, for those plants, yeah. Sodium bicarbonate or potassium bicarbonate. That's the stuff they sell under the brand name of uh, Green Cure. Uh, that's why I uh, pull out the torch. Right. Well, I will say this that we'll arrest it. Okay. It goes back about at least 100 years in, in nurseries around here. Um, but that's all it does is arrest it. <laughs> you know, you still got to do something. Uh, yeah, little boy, you broke your leg. I think we need to put a cast on it. Okay, good idea. So, uh, 
But in the nursery business, hey, screw it, man. You put on a, a master sprayer that can cover you know, it's, they're um, pulled by uh, trucks. So, was it uh, 200 gallon sprayers? And uh, you just drive them up and down the rows. I mean, think about it 30,000 plants on one acre in the nursery trade. 30,000 plants. In the chat so, here, I, I stirred up a storm, by the way, nothing to do with spider mites, but I stirred up a storm about uh, shawarma, and I realized I had to bring up dinner kebab. And uh, that, that's my show, basically. If anyone's curious, like, what do we do? Like, we talk about beer and weed and food, and Putin comes on and talks about, aqua, like, aquaponics and African snakes and stuff. And, yeah, yeah. Well, you're lucky that you live in a place like Portland. Well, all of us are. The... Uh, Everyone. The different types of uh, cuisine here is pretty broad. Mm. I mean, you can find some little, you know, nook necky places that, no, this is East Berlin, German food or something, you know, or, you know, uh, is real Berlin is weird for that. There's all kinds of like, uh, there's like Berlin sausage place. I can't even remember what it's called right now, but like a couple people told me about it. It's like a Berlin sausage cart. And actually, that's what it is. Yeah. Like, uh, Portland has all yeah. these parts. So not only like restaurants, Portland is this kind of huge underground Portland, uh, food city. And a lot of it is actually these carts. I was just talking about, uh, about this with somebody today. Uh, there's this cart, called, I think it's called Yoshi's maybe. Anyway, evidently it's some of the best, I haven't been there yet, but anyway, it's apparently some of the best sushi in the city of Portland. It's a freaking food cart. So anyway, right. That's, that's, um. How about the guy that sells like all the exotic salts from around the world? Right. Some of them, that's a cool story. Yeah, it's like all it is is just yeah, salt. Just salt. Yeah, and, and one of them is it's harvested yeah. here on the Oregon coast. Okay, that's pretty cool. And then he smokes it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of weird. Uh, it's it's kind of like adding really? berries. It's like adding berries to your beer, your kind of thing, you know. Dude, but don't uh, criticize the berry beer, man. The freaking uh, the framboise. Oh, oh my god, fuck. the Belgian, the framboise. Oh, you're one of those German no. groups, man. You're like four. Yes, I am. Hey, William the Fourth, man. That's why I sent you that article. William the Fourth decreed in the 15 or 1400 somewhere a long time ago that beer could only be made from three things: water, William hops, fourth, and, and uh, barley. Yeah, I, I listened to the re re reformed version, the William the Fifth. He's like, yeah, whatever. Put in berries and stuff. I don't know. There's something about when you drink German beer, you know that there's a tradition in that flavor. It's not like... Clean and crisp. Oh, this, no, no, this is Marion Berry beer from the Willamette Valley. What the fuck? You know, come yeah, on. I love it. Oh, cool. I love the Marion beer. Well, if it's good. Oh, Jesus There's this one Fawn Ebert. Oh, my freaking God. It's delicious. It's basically like they even have, I think it's a Marion Berry... Oh, for fuck's sake. It's a, uh, I can't remember right now, but it's a Marionberry Belgian style beer. It's so good. Oh, Lambic. Yeah, Lambic. Well, Lambic beer, Lambic. yeah. It was something else. It was like a, oh, whatever, Saison or something. It doesn't matter. But yeah, what's like, interesting. I love Lambics. Absolutely love those. Yeah. What's interesting about uh, EM1, that was the forerunner, if you will, of the KNF uh, fermented. So you bought this product. And it had some amount of lacto cultures, but they didn't tell you because this, they had to get it from the home office in Tokyo, Dr. Higa. All right, fair enough. Uh, so it's like it, not like it was, it was a pyramid scheme, the way that, that it was sold and distributed. So one day I was really bored and I was digging around some of the science. Uh, Sites like uh, Skyrus, S C I R U S dot com. It was a science search engine. Avoided all blogs or advertising screeds. It was strictly like uh, peer reviewed, double blind study type stuff, right? So, lo and behold, here's a uh, entry from an organization in New Zealand where adults are in charge of things like labeling. And you can't just say, well, it's proprietary. 
So they listed all the strains that were in the product. So I downloaded it and I did a copy and paste on all the names. Come to find out they were all yogurt, uh, lacto strains, Syrian, Greek, you know, you get the idea. And then there was this one lambic that you could get have to get not have to but you can get that from your home brew store so i used to jokingly tell people well you know you can make your own just hit whole foods and buy the smallest unit of yogurt you can get your hands on and make sure it's you know got live cultures in it and then stop at a brew store and there you go there's your uh, em1 That wasn't appreciated. Uh, a bunch of times, speaking of lambics, actually, they basically like the bottom swill at the bottom of that lambic, that kind of like pasty stuff. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I should stir that up. That's kind of EM1. Like it's not exactly the same right. thing. It doesn't have the same proportion or whatever. It's probably missing a few things, but you can pour it into a, a bucket and dilute it with water and it basically it works. And I've done that. Like every yeah, time I show, like when I have a beer, like that last week I had, a, unfortunately for me, I bought two of them. I had a beer that was just, just goddamn gross. It was either skunked or I, I think it was skunk because it was like an eight month old, like micro so It was eh, not, not that great. Uh, I poured it on my uh, freaking flower bed and everything's happy and super, like, just cheerful. <laughs> you know? This beer company, like, or brewery, micro brew, whatever you want to call it, pub, um, they opened up over real south. Real, like under underneath the Burnside Bridge, basically between that and the Willamette River, and they were only open for about six months. But a bunch of us from the produce industry went over there, and everybody's drinking this beer, and this is the house beer, the good stuff. So I tasted it, and I thought, man, there's something, there's something really weird about this beer. I couldn't, you know, quite put my finger on it. So I didn't drink much at all. A couple gulps. And God, God, man, the next day, there was about six people. They had to leave early. Diarrhea. There was something. (laughs) The beer wasn't finished. I'm not a brewer. I don't know. But anyway, it wasn't finished. And when it hit their digestive system, it just... And... It wasn't a good experience. It wasn't, you know, like you know, sharing some beers. So, yeah, like I said, they lasted about six months. That was when there's a lot of money floating around Portland. And there were breweries, micro breweries opening up everywhere. I mean, it's longer. It just depends on the beer style. Like, I have some uh, Deschutes stuff. They have their, like, seasonal annual things. that are, uh, They have a little bit higher alcohol content. Maybe that's one of the reasons. Mm-hmm. But, uh, anyway, we, I, don't know, I honestly don't know why they last longer. But uh, some of these beers, they age really well. And I guess, like I said, every single one of them that did had higher alcohol content. That must be one of the big things. Whatever. I'm just kind of speculating as I'm talking about it. Um, there's this one company that, or one uh, brewery that I've just digging everything. I have not, like, I've loved every single beer that I've had from them. Like even, uh, even Crux out in uh, Deschutes or out in uh, sure. Hood River, even they've had a couple beers. I'm like, man, whatever. Like Party of Clowns, I think I was kind of lukewarm on. Uh, Cascade Barrel Brewing. And stunning. Every single goddamn beer from them is stunning, uh, but they specialize in sours. And almost every beer I've had from them has also been aged. So like even at the tap, they've been like barrel aged from like 2017, 2019. They've had some stuff from like 2020 and it's aged super, super, super well. Like super interesting beers and they're sours. Like noticeably I, sour. I don't know what's going to happen after this uh, pandemic thing, but Oregon State had a uh, postgraduate degree, all the way to postgraduate degree in uh, brewing, really hardcore science stuff, right? And then they also have under their umbrella the Barley World portal, uh, which acts as a uh, information for growers or potential growers and to the public to explain why Oregon barley is, you know, what it is in, in the brewing world. It's high enzymes. So it makes better beer. It's shipped uh, every continent. 
Uh, it's not cheap. By, by compared to other places that you can get barley. And then a lot of it's malted. There's that big building right on the other side of the Willamette River, uh, Great Western Malt. That's where they malt a lot of stuff that goes to China. Well, Asia in general, and even including India. So, yeah, barley's a big deal here in the Northwest. We've got the right soil. For growing and, and a lot of uh, real estate for growing, you know, small barley farms, four or five thousand acres. So, we're talking like eight square miles, just to give you a point of reference. So and much, to... oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's much of it's grown sustainably, hmm. no, no till in the, in the real sense, not you know, this cannabis work thing. Well, I was going to say, speaking of barley, but more so speaking of grass seed, I used to know like a, a few friends of mine go, uh, in college, and I don't know, maybe I guess before that too, uh, especially out like Albany, uh, I think they all kind of came oh, yeah. out throughout the state, they grew grass seed is where I'm getting to. Yes, that. right. It's a really high margin uh, crop. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, think for the, I don't remember, my friends were telling me it was super fascinating to them, of course, my eyes were a little bit glazed over at the time, but uh, they told me like, oh, we harvest such and such deep, and there's all this fucking, there's basically a like a meter worth of money, basically, they were telling me. Remember, they even right. measured meters, maybe their tractors were European or something, but uh, I was just thinking like, every time people come up with these fancy grow systems, you know what I mean? I think of you these, these days with like, oh, why are they doing this complex thing or that complex thing? You know, you always say like, why aren't they getting a medal in front of the UN? Why aren't they feeding world hunger and so on? But you know, America's filled with capitalist greed. Why aren't they basically doing that technique for the grass seed growers, like in Albany? Like they, they those guys love to make money, you know, and they, they would love to make more money. Why aren't these fancy techniques that we sometimes hear about, about microbial prolapses and everything else, why aren't those guys working for the, the grass seed guys, right? Yeah, there's, uh, this is a, that industry, Specifically, here's a true, well, it was a horrible experience. It was when we moved here in 88, there was a pileup on I-5 that involved several dozen cars and killed a lot. A lot of people died. And it was from the smoke because they would burn the fields after harvest. They would burn the straw. And the wind shifted. And so all this heavy smoke went right to the freeway at an area that you know uh, was right around, uh, somewhere around Salem. So, you know, that's the state capital for Christ's sake. A lot of traffic. And it was just a horrible disaster. So then after that, um, the laws changed, the banning the burning. So the farmers, Obviously, they had to hire people, but they came up with a way of taking the straw and pressing it and getting a resin out of it. And that resin then became the basis of planks that like two by fours, two by sixes to replace wood for parks, uh, public places. And it's impervious to knives and uh, you know, you can't stop paint. That's that's a whole other issue. But you can start from getting carved up. So it became really popular around the country. So eventually, the grass seed growers were making more money of ma manufacturing these planks uh, that went to cities and county governments around the United States, around the world, really, uh, for a new product to replace uh, traditional wood uh, bus benches and park benches and that kind of stuff. So out of a tragedy came. But yeah, if you, you live in like in the Midwest or even where uh, Steve's at in Oklahoma, um, you go into a garden center and to buy grass seed for your home. There's a really, really, really good possibility it's going to say Oregon on there somewhere. And there's another place right on I-5 they grow turf like you lay down for well golf courses and whatever and they cut it in strips and then it's rolled up 
and that's how it's, uh, you transport it. Um, but anyway, the name of the company is Rolling a Lawn. It's right on I-5 as you're, it's on the uh, east side of the freeway. But that's what they do is they grow the kind of stuff used on golf courses and even t tennis courts, uh, grass, you know, they do some really high tech uh, grass stuff. So. A lot of agriculture in this place. Cannabis uh, industry could have learned a lot when they came here and the investors, I mean, they weren't interested. They, no, no, we'll, we'll put all this money in it because if you throw enough money at it, it's going to work. And then it didn't. So now, you know, there's a transition. Things are changing. Have you done Our any stage. work with like uh, dynamic accumulators? Uh, in that sense, yes. Uh, the main one being uh, comfrey for two reasons. One is the biomass that is generated from a single piece of root. It's with you regardless of weather patterns. Um, things that like nettle, while they're wonderful, I agree, but the amount of biomass that you get out of a plant doesn't begin to approach what you get from comfort. For example, it's been my experience, at least in, I'm not in my perfect situation, but after about the third year with four cuttings, I can expect to get over a cubic yard per plant. So if you start out with say six plants, your comfrey patch, that's a pretty good amount of uh, material to work with. In England, where peat moss is really a political issue between the, the Brits and the uh, Irish, because in Ireland, a lot of homes are uh, heated by peat moss. There's more to it than horticulture. In fact, that has nothing to do with it. And um, so one of the replacements is to use compost and comfrey leaves in a potting soil mix. Uh, the, the, the man who, well, developed the, um, the varieties that we grow, Bocking 14, there were, he lived on Bocking Road in uh, Essex and he was a, a nurseryman and he developed the Bocking series and 14 is the one that we've landed on and have been since the late forties. So all, everything that we grow is cuts or cuts or cuts, you get the idea. And uh, so once you plant it, and it's established, it's there. It grows roots that are deeper than fruit trees. So we're talking 15 to 18 feet, that's really deep. But uh, I guess I'm not sure, uh, see, nettle. Um, the stinging nettle is one of my favorite ones. Hey there, Tara, yeah. how's it going? Look there. Good evening, how are you guys? Done. Ready to dab. Right. New hairstyle. Cheers. Looks good. Thought I'd do the pigtails today. The, the, the freaking color changing, like the peacocks have multiplied. Uh, the I got guy lots of peacocks. About, I meant to say this the other day. Tara, if you ever need new peacock feathers and wonderful worm castings, go to Doug over at Northwest uh, Red Worms because he has like peacocks. Cool. Like he'll tell you about his stupid peacocks. He has the funniest stories. Like they do the I, dumbest stuff. They fly up like to the top of the tree. They can fly. I didn't know they can fly. Yeah, like, my friends fly, have them. Don't want to. Yeah, my you friends know, have them. That's actually uh, my friends gave me all of these peacock feathers. They gifted me a whole tub full of them. Is that can, true? That they yeah. can fly, but they choose not to because that seems so. You dumb. can. You can drive down the freeway like in L.A. Any, you just go over through the neighborhoods. You can just get all the feathers you want off the side of the road now. Did you see that? They actually have their LA's calling for like a special uh, 
um, like uh, a ban on feeding them and all that stuff for the, the wild ones because they're sure. taking over and they're pissing everyone off because they're loud as fuck. They are. They're really obnoxious. I can't imagine anyone would have them as a pet. They're horrible. Jesus. They're messy, too. Uh, yeah, there's shit everywhere. They, uh, oh my God. they do look <laughs> awesome like, for, uh, for home decor. That's for sure. <laughs> it's worse than having geese. It's all they do is crap. I mean, just a mess. You really want to, you get a, you get a sun conure, and then you get uh, yeah, some, some yeah. geese, you get a yeah. guinea fowl, and then a peacock. And I guarantee you, like, if you, yeah, you will have really, real good friends with your neighbors. I got geese. I have that two old, African geese. That old country expression, faster than shit through a goose. So, yeah, Africans are beautiful. I mean, they're all beautiful. It's just really, uh, you ever had weeder geese or uh, the geese you run through your garden to eat uh, beetles and what have you? But they actually eat weeds. They're called weed. It's, I forget the uh, variety, but weeder geese is the collective title. So we can't call they're those. Geese, they're all joint. Yeah. No cobras, then. Or can we? Yeah, I don't know the whole story. I just know that they're used. Yeah, weeder geese, and they eat weeds for some reason. Old British, old British uh, custom in the organic uh, arena. IPM, I guess you'd call it. Nice. What's uh what's new with you, Tara? What have you been up to? How's your garden? My poor garden is in transplant shock right now. That's what happened. Yeah, it just uh I I kind of didn't take the best care of them. And then like a big windstorm came up right when they got taken out of the greenhouse and got whipped and stuff, you know, so they don't look the prettiest right now, but Hey, it's early in the summer. I got lots of time. It's supposed to be like triple digits next week. They're going to, it's like, they got plenty of time to grow. We'll be fine. I've never heard of that before. Like, I guess you, uh, uh, I don't know. You guys have like different geography. Have you ever seen like triple digit weather in June? I've never seen that. Yeah, here we have. Really? Here, like it'll get to be like maybe every couple of, well, actually these years it's every year, but like uh, every year now it'll get to be 106 for a couple of days, uh, but only a couple of days and it'll be like late August, maybe September and that's it. So this year I can't even imagine. Well, I'm I'm really scared for the fire season. You know, the, there was a thing yeah. like the other day about uh, they were out checking early May and they were seeing moisture levels that were akin for like July normally and early May. Like it's bad. Every the whole West is really behind snow snowpack, and you know I'm really really worried about my friends in the mountains and stuff. Oh, for sure. I think it's after la last year's experience, we lost three or four communities in southern oregon my home was within a mile of a fire uh, this is this neighborhood is built in the 1840s these are all old not just wood but old wood and uh, and we're in much worse condition this year than last and i'm right on the river i'm right on the uh, largest river in western oregon the willamette and then uh, with the confluence with the Clackamas River that flows out of Mount Hood. It's been a really dry so, spring, too. So not only is it hot and dry now, but right. it's a dry spring. Yeah. When you go down the river, there's a big giant sign that says, Coots Roost. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, I, uh, just not human, That that's going to happen, too. But uh, there's going to be a lot of economic pain again in the cannabis scene this year. You're probably right, Coot. Last year we had a terrible, like, uh, this is something a lot of people maybe didn't realize. Uh, Terra probably had the same issues. A lot of us in the Northwest basically had this unbearable, uh, like, like you could cut it with a knife, basically, smog. And it was from the burning fires, basically, from the fires yes. that surrounding us. First, they started for weeks. Washington for weeks on end. It got to the point that yeah. we were kind of quarantined, like, right before 
was this before COVID? I don't even remember anymore now. It's been such a freaking strange long time. But basically everybody was sitting inside because the air outside was actually toxic to everyone, not just to the old and the young, but to yeah. everyone. It was that severe. So they said, if you can't, if you don't have to go outside, if you don't have to go outside, don't go outside. It was that bad. And it was for fucking weeks. And uh, everybody, all my friends basically that had to harvest weed or honestly, almost everyone that had weed uh, growing outside that wasn't in some kind of isolated basin their weed was messed up and smoky and not in the good way, not like a gassy way or something like you couldn't wash it off. Like, it yeah, it, it was, it was last August, September yeah, last August. when the fire started. Yeah. The whole state was on fire. Oh, it was atrocious. Yeah. And so it, we're, it was, we were actually lucky here though. Like our area actually doesn't really get that way. We're, we kind of sit down in the hill hole in this basin area. And so, the smoke just kind of blows right around us. We get really lucky. One of my buddies, I wow. won't say who, but uh, one of my buddies, uh, uh, that, you know, sometimes has come on my show. He lives in kind of a basin and all of the rest of our friends got messed up and he, all the wind just kind of blew around him and his, he was fine. All of his weed was fine. Funny. Got lucky. But yeah, I'm definitely concerned about this year. I think it's going to be worse than last year by a considerable margin so well i would think oklahoma is going to have just incredibly hot weather arid beyond arid it's like you're out in a desert um I don't know, wow it's pretty moist though i mean it, it was 102 103 today where we are so and it's currently one 22 a.m. and it's 86 degrees. <laughs> I was just bitching about that. Wow, I mean, it's gonna be so weird. Oh my god, like, you know, we don't we're not even getting a cool off period at nighttime, it's just staying hot. <laughs> All righty, well, <clears throat> what uh, what else has been going on in your garden there, Tara? Have you got anything else going on? What uh, what cultivars are you growing? Uh, the Congo. I got the Congo back. That's two of my favorite ones that I'm like really excited to grow this year. Um, them are really, they're pretty big. I would, I've been growing them since like last year. So they were in like big pots and I actually transplanted them out. So they were already about four feet tall. So they're, they've got us quite a bit of jump. We'll see how they get going. Um, so those I'm excited about. I have a freeze dryer now, so I'll be able to do freeze drying hash, bubble hash this next year. So I'm super excited about that. Um, cool. Yeah. So I already have, I've already been pressing rosin. I've been doing that for years. So now I want to step it up. So super excited to step up my game. Nice. And That's been neat. going down the rabbit hole with Jadam. I'm really enjoying Jadam. Um, I'm understanding it a lot better now working behind the scenes with Drake and some friends. So I'm really enjoying it. Nice. Yeah. You guys have been doing a lot of shows. To, uh, you have your morning show and some other stuff that you do. Why don't you tell people about that? Uh, yeah, we've been trying to go live on a more regular schedule because YouTube's not the greatest at giving you notifications. So we try and go live at Wednesdays and Saturdays at nine o'clock a.m. Pacific time. So we're just trying to keep it regular right now. Um, we've been trying to have guests on uh, rotating through and then we kind of do Jadam and we talk and take questions from people, beginners or other people. And then if we don't know your answer, or if we don't know the answer, we'll try and figure it out for you and get back to you. So, cool. yeah. That's awesome. And every now and then we're making appearances on Fumi show in the evening. We're out, you know, it's always nice to have somebody to hang out with on the evening, you know, insomniacs. <laughs> always fun when you stop by, Tara. You guys always talk about, uh, well, all kinds of random stuff. DK comes on and talks about uh, Jadam and freaking uh, weed. And it's always a nice diversion. You're always welcome. Always yeah. Fun. He's a very awesome co-host. I'm really lucky to have him. Can't wait till the border opens so we can actually go meet up. We're only like, we're only like six or six hours away from one another. Just like I'm straight south and he's straight north. It's just crazy. 
So, yeah. Awesome. So, Steve, when are you going back to Africa? Or are you going back? Uh, at some point, I'll head back. I actually have two projects there. And we have, I actually have another one that I'm in the talks with there back in uh, South Africa. But um, uh, right now, I don't have any current plans. I have some stuff in the Caribbean. So, I'll definitely be back to the Caribbean later in the year. Once I get everything kind of on autopilot, set to autopilot up here in Oklahoma, once I get moved and we get the new company up and running and stuff, then I'll be able to kind of run around. I have some projects in Georgia. There's a big farm I'm helping set up out there. So that's been going well. Uh, and then just some other stuff around the state of Oklahoma. I have some smaller projects I'm helping put together and a couple of bigger ones. So that's been kind of just uh, a lot of running around and also just working on the education stuff. I'm trying to finish up I have a, a aquaponic vegetable uh, online course I've been working on slowly but surely. I have um, a uh, aquaponic cannabis book, which a lot of people know about. I've been working on trying to finish. Uh, and then I have another book, which I haven't hasn't been announced yet that I'll be coming out on. Um, well, we'll leave it on that. But there's another book I'm working on with a cool uh, co-author on that uh, will be coming out hopefully later this year, probably next year, I'll be honest with you. Um, just a lot of crazy stuff going on, but that's that's kind of all the stuff I got going on at the moment. I had some other one or two other things, but that's most of it. And then got a new pupper, so it's been uh, you know getting everyone adjusted and everything. But she's been really really awesome, and well behaved, so I can't complain. What kind? Same as the other one, wolf husky malamute, except she's more husky than he oh, is. Cool. He's more more wolf. So. Well, congratulations! I'm glad you got a new. Yeah, we found this lady who had to give her up because they were in a different living situation and they couldn't take the dog and they didn't really know what to do and no, they couldn't take it to the shelter because they won't take wolf dogs. So a lot of shelters won't, so they didn't really know what to do and it wasn't very far from where we were and we were already kind of looking for one and she's fixed so I don't have to worry about like, you know, being overrun with puppies. So <laughs> worked out well. Also worked out well too because there's no more separation anxiety. We can leave them alone all day and they're fine. There's no more. Uh... Dude, dogs are like people, man. They always like to be better with another dog. You know what I mean? You should always have, it's like fish. You should always have like two fish, always two dogs. Like people, man. It really solved the only issues we were having with our dog, which was leaving them alone for long periods of time. Sometimes you get kind of weird, but it's all good now. So can't complain. And then moving here next month, so that'll be fun. I'll actually have more of a, a lab space, get the microscopes all set up again and, and start doing a lot more uh, you know, cooler content again, like I used to do. So I'm happy about that because I've been kind of, even since I got back from Africa, I've been still kind of been living kind of out of a box, uh, bouncing around doing consulting and all this other stuff and having to kind of have like a home base where I could unpack all my shit again. And it'd be nice to do that, so. Super stoked to, to get back to doing all that stuff and being able to do some cooler filming and stuff again. So, yeah. Exciting. All right. Well, uh, I think we'll wrap up the show. It's been quite the long episode. Uh, last episode and this episode, both. Uh, every time we get Coot on, man, me and Coot go on for hours. Right noticed that i think i know the shortest episode i think we've done so far is three hours and 39 minutes when coot and i are both on so <laughs> um, but it's kind of share the same vibe right the same kind of slightly misanthropic who largely misanthropic but like uh cynical but optimistic vibe yeah um why don't everybody tell everybody uh, how to find you? Coot, uh, uh, how do people find more about you if they want to listen? Uh, you know, you've done quite a few episodes here and on Fumi's show, you're on there quite a bit. Yeah, I pretty much retired. Um, I don't know. I, I've got it down. I don't do anything exciting. I just the uh, same old, same old. Worm castings, blah, blah, blah. Uh, water. So uh, you guys are on the cutting edge. And uh, I admire that. It's what it needs. We don't need more chemical salesmen, you know, from 
Scott, Miracle Grow, and the rest of the, you know, the crowd. So, but for me, I just uh, just do what I do. Uh, build, try to build the best soil I can, and let uh, things go the way they're going to go. That's about it. Not too exciting. Wish everybody a really good uh, weekend, and uh, try to stay cool if you're here in the West. So it's not going to be pretty. What uh? What about you, Tara? How do people find you, and if they want to check out more of your stuff? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Tara Lee Live, and also on YouTube at Tara Lee Live. And who knows where else I'm invited to join panels throughout the internet, off and on all these panels. I met all you guys, so it's awesome. Sure, Thanks Thank for you. hanging out, everybody. And chat, you're always awesome. Chat's so cool. Chat's always awesome. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for being here. Peace Thanks. and love as always. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Thanks for coming on. What about you, Fumi? Uh, I've been <laughs> smoking so much that I don't remember what I was supposed to say about anything. So I guess uh, come watch us on my channel and uh, come get stoned with us. I like to say puff something wonderful, and uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. Come watch us on Saturday. It'll be fun. And uh, check out, um, you can always check out more of this podcast and the uh, Growing with Fishes on, uh, or Potent Ponics on your favorite podcast app. Uh, I am on over, I think, 500 different podcast platforms now with the show. Uh, so it, sometimes it takes a day or two to disseminate out, but you can find us in audio format on a lot of different places now. Um, also, most of the YouTube content that I have, especially anything that's more talk related or, in, you know, isn't strictly re reliant on, on the visual, uh, I do also upload in audio format. So if you just want to listen to some of the stuff that I do have uh, from some of the other talks you, uh, while you're working or something or working out, you can do that. Uh, and then you can find out, um, Marty and I do have the online class at apmjclass.com. Uh, if you do need nutrients, uh, we do have apmjnutes.com, which we started because uh, after three years of doing the show, people kept asking me where to get fish safe nutrients. So we decided to uh, just make a website for that because, you know, I got tired of giving people five different websites. There wasn't one place really to get all the stuff that I needed. Um, so you can check that out there or just use it to figure out what you need to order for yourself, whatever. I don't care. It's more of a resource there for you, but we do. Uh, it does help the show and help with hosting costs and all that stuff. So uh, we do appreciate it. And then we also have um, t-shirts. If you do like aquaponic cannabis growing uh, or the podcast, you want a t-shirt, we have those available at jellybomb.com. Uh, and uh, we do still, I believe have the, uh, uh, yes, you can still donate to the Stony Scholar Family Relief Fund. Uh, again, link in the description. Uh, um, we did lose a friend of ours earlier this year. Uh, you can still donate. Uh, we've raised over $1,300 for his family. Uh, to date so a uh, shout out to everybody that that's donated to that so uh, thanks everybody for watching 